New York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. Checking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right, we got a big show for you today. We're covering the top stories moving and shaping markets this morning. Big banks kicking off earnings season, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo all reporting record results here. The early read, JP Morgan blowing past rivals, proving it's best positioned in 2024. Let's break down what these results say throughout the show about the risk of recession and the strength of the consumer. And it's blue skies ahead for Delta Airlines in some facets here. The airline almost doubling its fourth quarter profit. I spoke with the CEO, Ed Bastian, on what the airline's quarterly results tell us about travel demand that we can anticipate this year. But first, let's lay out your roadmap for the day and get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Yahoo Finance's retail reporter, Brooke De Palma, markets reporter, Jared Blickery, and senior audience reporter, Cross Supermanian, around the newsroom with more. A slew of U.S. investment banks report a quarterly earnings this morning. J.P. Morgan rising above its rivals with a record annual profit of $49 billion. Now that's more annual profit than any lender in the history of the American banking system. A banking industry, that is. We'll break down what these results signal about the health of the consumer. And oil prices jumping following U.S.-led airstrikes on Yemen's Houthis in retaliation for escalating attacks on ships in the Red Sea. The move stirring fears of more conflict in the region. We're going to continue to track this throughout the day. Strong earnings for Delta here, but the street not exactly happy with guidance. Delta reported top line revenue of $14.2 billion versus $13.53 billion and adjusted EPS of $1.28 versus $1.17. Big beat there, but it's the airline's full year profit guidance are disappointed with full year adjusted EPS forecast coming in at $6 to $7 a share versus a $7 a share that it forecast previously. Well, let's get to our top story of the day, big bank results. We're getting a mixed picture from bank stocks and pre-market trading as the big four, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo kick off earnings season with their fourth fiscal quarter results this morning. J.P. Morgan moving higher. It raked in a record $49.6 billion in annual net income, the most ever in the history of the American banking industry. The bank did take a profit hit as paid off regulatory fees from its regional bank rescues. The other three bank stocks under a bit of pressure as investors contend with how these firms have held up amid a higher rate environment. A big theme that we're honing in on today is what these results say about the consumer. In that vein, let's get to some of our key takeaways here as we're taking a look at the pre-market movements. I think two things really stuck out to us. One thing that really jumped out to me is just how the banks are talking about the economic environment right now here. And from J.P. Morgan's CEO, Jamie Dimon, in his seat, he said, it's important to note that the economy right now is being fueled by large amounts of government deficit spending, past stimulus, also an ongoing need for increased spending due to the green economy, restructuring of global supply chains, higher military spending, rising health care costs, all these things considered. He says this may lead inflation to be stickier and rates to be higher than markets expect. No doubt markets going to pay attention to that this morning as you're seeing some of the futures right now lower across the board for the U.S. major averages. Yes, yeah, certainly, Brad. And even to that point, despite all that uncertainty out there, Jamie Dimon once again reiterating the fact that he is, quote, confident in their ability to continue to deliver very healthy returns. So we talk about what this quarter, what this past year has told us about the banks and how they are set up into 2024. And once again, J.P. Morgan just blowing away the rivals. And when you take a look at these numbers, that record annual profit that you were just referencing there, Brad, really just solidifying the fact that J.P. Morgan has separated itself from the rest of the banks. And I think that was on full display these past couple of quarters, and especially when you take into account those annual results. And keep in mind that these results all happen when you take into account the annual numbers that we're getting during a very volatile, scary, uncertain year for the banking industry. Remember, it was just last March, under a year ago, when we saw a number of the regional banks come under pressure, a few collapse. We saw J.P. Morgan obviously playing a massive role in some of the rebuilding, some of that confidence there, adding some stability 
to the entire sector. So how that is set up here for 2024, one, there's a lot of uncertainty, but two, I think given all that, there's still a lot of reason to be optimistic about some of these larger names. And just briefly here, cost discipline that you're going to hear a little bit more about. We heard that from the Bank of America CEO, uh, Brian Moynihan here, and he has said essentially that our expense discipline allowed us to continue to invest in growth initiatives, strong capital, liquidity levels, positioning them well to continue to deliver responsible growth in 2024. All right, well, let's get Wall Street's take on this morning's top story. Big bank results dominating the headlines. Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, City, Wells Fargo, among the top trending tickers here at Yahoo Finance. Now, the standout in this quarter in the past year, I should say, is J.P. Morgan, the bank's record annual profit, driven by higher interest rates and also higher margins in its lending business. Joining us now, we want to bring in Ken Leon. He's CFRA Research Director of Equity Research. Ken, it's great to have you. So first, just drilling down into J.P. Morgan's results first. What do you think that tells us just about the positioning and the fact that they are by far the leader, it seems like at this point, as we kick off the rest of 2024. Well, well, JP Morgan has always been, you know, top of the pack and uh, not distracted by restructuring or any discontinued businesses. They can focus on their customers in the markets. We're seeing, you know, outsized uh, capital returns. Um, and the picture looks good for 2024. Uh, there's some puts and takes as it relates to now moving into a uh, rate cut regime from the Fed. Uh, but the loan volume, if the U.S. economy stays firm, and I'm speaking of a soft landing, not a recession, uh, then we're going to see uh, a benefit not only for fee income from loans, uh, but also net interest income as guided by J.P. Morgan today being pretty good. You know, when we get a read through to how all of these banks are talking about the consumer and the economy, what most notably would you be listening for on all of these earnings call? What would investors be apt to pay closest attention to here as we get some of the forecasts, but also um, almost the meteorologic uh, analysis from some of these CEOs on the economy? Well, banks by their nature are, are, are a pretty nervous lot when it comes to uh, getting payments. And we're seeing still a pretty healthy consumer um, but we're also seeing back to a, a normalized uh, environment uh, where savings rates are down. We're beginning to see a pickup in delinquencies for credit cards, uh, but nothing that we would see that's too far from the historic average. Um, also, uh, small business, middle market still looks good. Uh, jobs, employment numbers are good. And uh, when we look at the corporate markets, uh, probably they're more sensitive as multinationals to geopolitical risk uh, out of the gate in 2024. They might be a little bit more conservative on capital investment. Uh, but we hit an inflection point on investment banking fees back last year. We expect 2024 to see that pent up the demand uh, for equity and debt underwriting as well as M&A. You know, Ken, just on something that you mentioned a moment ago and, and the provisions for credit losses, that, that came to mind for me because it seemed like across the board a read through was heightened provisions for credit losses, signaling that the banks might have this anticipation of unpaid credit obligations that, that could rise even further from here. What's your read through there? Yeah, I, and we look at it closely and we do deep dives um, every quarter. Uh, the consumer, I've already noted, fairly stable, but obviously you have to watch uh, credit card loans and maybe auto. Uh, when you look over to commercial real estate, uh, they've already reserved, so they're releasing those reserves as uh, loan provisions, which flows into the income statement. What does this all mean? We don't see a distressed industry on corporate loan book, uh, nor do we see any sovereign country risk. Of course, with cities' results, they had trading losses from Argentina and also Russia. Uh, but overall, uh, the credit book looks good. I would say when you get to the back half of 24, we may see the banks release these reserves if the economy stays good and the loan provisions is going at a lower rate. Uh, time to tell, but that would be a positive for earnings in the back part of the year. 
Can when you c compare what we've seen from uh, some of these banks to what we're seeing here this morning from City, with some weakness there, not necessarily a massive surprise given uh, the warning that we got from the bank just yesterday and, of course, what has played out at the bank over the last several years. But some of the changes that are underway and CEO Jane Fraser saying that the quarter was, quote, very disappointing doing, due to the impact of some of those notable items that they had uh, released on Wednesday after the bell. But the bank, though, is making substantial process uh, progress executing on their strategy. What's your risk assessment of City and where it stands today? Yeah, so for City, especially, uh, it's a multi year transformation. There is going to be bumps along the road in 24. Um, it's, it's difficult, really, to get the business streamlined in a hurry. Um, and what Jane Fraser is trying to do, uh, they announced 20,000 headcount cut, and no surprise here. Uh, but it's very hard to be very competitive in some of the businesses we've mentioned. But at the same time, <clears throat> you have some of your key talent worried about whether they have a job or not. Um, but I, I, I think she's on the right direction. Uh, the analysts on the street really like City. Uh, it was an outperformer in the fourth quarter, but all bank stocks did well. So today's uh, trading on share prices, we're just seeing some consolidation on, on the prices. Um, I thank for Jane Fraser. Um, she's on the right track. Uh, but I like quality, which is why we have a buy recommendation on J.P. Morgan Chase next week on Morgan Stanley. Uh, we have whole ratings on Citi uh, as well as Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Okay, and then taking into account the numbers that we're getting out this morning, looking ahead to the results that we'll get next week with Morgan Stanley with Goldman Sachs, what do you think today's results, how does that set us up for the results that we will get on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week? Um, they're directionally going to be moving more positively, but not V-shaped in the first quarter, if you will, or first half. Um, investment banking, there is enormous backlog, particularly from private equity firms that want to monetize uh, their investments and their funds, either for M&A or underwriting. So Goldman and Morgan Stanley are going to benefit from that. The durable businesses of asset and wealth management are, are really going to shine next week. Um, and I think the investment banking story will be, again, that we hit the trough of the cycle last year. We will see improvement this year. And so long as there's no other unexpected event uh, or dark swan, uh, that will be a pretty good picture. Uh, where there's a worry, of course, is uh, more regulation, tighter regulation on capital requirements, uh, which uh, is top of mind for investors. Ken Leon, CFRA Research Director of Equity Research. Ken, thanks so much for taking the time breaking down bank earnings with us this morning. Thank you. Certainly. Let's go to the skies. Delta Airlines is the first among its peers to report results for the holiday travel period. Delta saw another strong quarter for travel demand. The company beating on the top and bottom line, posting two billion dollars in Q4 profits, but the company did trim its 2024 earnings forecast. I got a chance to speak to Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian about these results and what he expects to see in the year ahead. One of the things that I am most uh, proud of when I look at our achievements in 23 uh, was the work our team did in providing an, an outstanding product uh, for our customers. Uh, we just finished the, the busiest holiday travel period in our history for the 15-day period around Christmas, New Year's break. Um, as a result, we uh, we also closed the years out with uh, revenues at, at an all-time high. Uh, and 24 is off to a flying start as well. And when he talks about that flying start that 24 is off to here in this year, uh, they actually just saw the highest cash sales day in its history, January 9th, so just earlier this week. So that is adding to this optimistic outlook here. But it's a larger question of how long this can continue. We were just talking about the CPI airfare prints that came out just yesterday, this week, and really evaluating what consumers are seeing in this even value-conscious environment that would propel them to continue to make 
make some of these bookings, take those trips? Is it as simple as you got a friend that didn't get married during 2020, they had to push it all the way out to 2024, and now you just got to make sure you travel for their wedding? Yeah, I think the big question going into this year, especially when you compare it to the pent-up demand that we had seen over the last two years, is whether or not any of that is going to carry into this year and, of course, to what degree. So I think that's what a number of these airline CEOs are trying to figure out up until this point. We're going to hear a little bit more when we get more results from the sector over the coming weeks. But in terms of demand, no surprise that this past quarter was huge here for the company. When we talk about record travel over the Thanksgiving, over the holiday period, the fact that people were still willing to spend despite the fact that it's a very uncertain environment. So I think taking all of that into account, and it's an extremely optimistic setup here, at least on the demand side of things, when you take out the costs and some of the uh, pressures that we're seeing uh, from other factors, obviously, on airlines. From the demand side of things, I think there's a lot to still be encouraged about at this point. Yeah, and people are taking a look at the screen here and taking a look at at the stock price reaction here this morning, perhaps wondering why shares are down 5%. Let's add a little bit more color on that. I had the chance of asking Ed Bastian how long he thinks this surge in travel demand and spending can persist. Here's what he had to say. Travel is just catching up to its normal level of activity, and it's been viewed to be revenge travel, and it's really just people just returning to the skies uh, because the economy is larger and, and the, the health of the industry is doing well. So, no, it's, we, we, uh, we ended the year, as I mentioned earlier, 20% above pre-pandemic levels. We expect this year to set another record. So I think the return of international travel will be uh, multi-year, uh, the journey. I don't think the price points will be as expensive uh, as they were this past year, but they're still going to be at a very healthy level for us. And so with that in mind, one of the kind of normalization considerations here for investors is that one thing that has to be readjusted or recalibrated here is the expenses that are going into this operation. You have a pilot negotiation that finally came to a conclusion last year. You also had that capacity restoration effort, plus bringing on more aircraft. Those aircraft, they actually just made an announcement here today for Airbus um, and that partnership that's going to continue to move forward, uh, potentially going to add another cost component to this purchasing a, uh, 20 A350-1000s with options for 20 additional wide-body aircraft from Airbus. Those are scheduled to begin in 2026. And so he did give us a little bit more color on that, saying essentially that that is one of the contributors to the cost inputs. And I think additionally here, you've got to think about the margin, the, the growth deceleration here. The margin growth deceleration is something that investors might be also paying close attention to here. Coming off of what was the revenge travel and the restoration of capacity and everybody getting back to the air, well now it's going to be tough comps that uh, all the airline operators really have to think about too. It is going to be tough comps. That was obviously evident in this forecast, but I also thought it's important to point out, and he noted this uh, in the release and in the conversation with you, just in terms of the fact that they're still optimistic about some of their long-term uh, profit targets here. So the fact that they haven't been able to reach at more than $7 a share, a target that they've had for 2024, questions about whether or not they're going to be able to do that. And Bastian saying that with all the uncertainty in the environment, they thought that it was important for them to be prudent at this time, but they're not giving up on the $7 a share. So they're still optimistic that they are going to get there, but obviously the cost pressures when it comes to wages, when it comes to higher fuel costs, taking that into account when it also comes to some of that CapEx spending clearly is going to weigh in results, at least in the short term. I'll tell you one other thing they're not giving up on. They're not giving up on Boeing here. Despite the fleet update that I just mentioned and the purchase of those A350-1000s from Airbus, they're continuing to have confidence in Boeing. And here's what he had to say uh, about Boeing when I had the opportunity to speak with Delta CEO Ed Bastian. We do not operate the MAX currently, as you know, um, and we have no intent and plan to operate the MAX 9 either. Uh, obviously a, a concerning event. Uh, it's one that we uh, are not in a position to speculate as to, as to what happened. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I have full faith in Boeing. Boeing is a great, great company. And so just a little bit more color. They do not operate the MAX-9. Delta Airlines does anticipate that Boeing will begin delivering a portion of its order, though, for 100 737 MAX-10 aircraft 
to come in 2025 here. So that is one thing to continue to watch within the relationship between both the airline operator and the aircraft manufacturer. But there you heard it from Ed Bastian, still has confidence in them as a technology company. Uh, and of course, one of the great American stories of aircraft ingenuity as well. Yeah, and that's exactly what we've heard from a number of the strategists and analysts that we've been talking to over the last five days, right? Obviously, the developments and the headlines that have been coming out from Boeing, it is concerning. It is a short-term issue that needs to be addressed, addressed and addressed in a very timely manner. But when you take into account and take a step back at what this means for the larger picture of Boeing in terms of that systemic risk, there's no real sign or any evidence right now that some of these airlines should be adjusting future orders or lose confidence in Boeing. That was my main takeaway from many of the analysts that we've talked to uh, over the last several days. And it sounds like Ed Bastian also agrees with that to a certain degree and saying that he is confident just in terms of what Boeing is doing with its products and the company and what the future holds for them. Yeah, and there's just such a backlog, as we were speaking with some of those analysts earlier this week, too, of being able to work through some of the supply chain issues, take delivery of aircraft as well, and then replace those and move those into the cycle of routes that they already operate or routes that are coming online as well here. Just lastly, and I'll close on this, uh, he mentioned that the Boeing 737 MAX 10 is anticipated to have an elevated customer experience, improved fuel efficiency as well, uh, and some of the best-in-class performance that they have come to expect from Boeing over the years and perhaps will uh, move them forward, propel them to, you know, higher heights. Higher heights. Everybody wants to go there. <laughs> anyway, a big thanks to Delta CEO Ed Bastian for that interview. We appreciate it. We're going to dive deeper into Delta's earnings at 10 a.m. with Peter McNally, Third Bridge Global Sector Lead for Industrials, Materials, and Energy. Stay tuned for that conversation. Well, oil prices are on the move this morning, reacting after U.S.-led retaliatory strikes against Yemen-backed Houthi rebels in this, uh, the Red Sea sparked fresh fears of further escalation in the region. The strikes marked the first major U.S. military response to ongoing Houthi attacks on commercial ships in the region. Joining us now to discuss, we've got Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, who is the former White House Middle East advisor and former ambassador to Morocco here. Thanks for, for joining us over the phone here this morning. First and foremost, what is the, the net impact that you're kind of anticipating here and, and how do sides even come to some type of discussion in order to de-escalate the situation? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's uh, room for discussion. The Houthi rebels are part of the broader project of Iran's axis of resistance against Israel and the United States. And uh, the Houthi rebels, uh, who have been attacking uh, the, sh the shipping, are doing so at the behest of Iran uh, and all of the weaponry that they've had, including ballistic missiles, ships, you name it, have come from Iran. Uh, Iran has every intention of trying uh, to undermine Israel's defense uh, as well as to preoccupy the United States, put pressure on the world. After all, it's going to cost, it's costing a million dollars for every tanker ship that has to circumvent uh, the Red Sea around Africa. Uh, and uh, it's affecting 55 countries when you multiply the number of ships times 55 countries whose uh, shipments are going through the Red Sea to the Suez Canal. Boy, you got a lot of money that's at stake here. So then what should the U.S. do? What can the U.S. do just in terms of their ability to be successful and whatever, whatever strategy continues to come from the Biden administration? Well, the good thing about this is that the United States is acting in concert with at least 20 other countries, Australia, you know, United mm -hmm. Kingdom, the Saudis, et cetera, and with the behest of a United Nations Security Council resolution. Look, the only way that to stop this is to basically neutralize the Houthi rebels' radar and capacity to attack tankers and to put in effect, go back to the good old bad days of uh, the Somali pirates when uh, tankers were escorted around uh, the, um, the Red Sea and as well as the uh, Persian Gulf uh, with armed escorts. And, and until the Houthi rebels stop attacking and trying to engage in sabotage and terrorism, unfortunately, we're gonna need to go back to those days. Investors today are, are tracking a few of the reactions taking place, whether that be in logistics and supply chain, whether that be in oil prices as well. H historically, what have we seen in those reactions? What has become perhaps, um, you know, most expected at this point in time? And, and how much of a long tail does that, does that really have an impact on oil from what you've seen in the past? Well, it all depends on Iran. I mean, because if Iran comes to the rescue, 
of uh, of the Houthis, and they've already placed destroyers and other naval equipment and naval uh, assets around the Houthis to provide them the eyes and ears they need to attack these uh, ships and uh, engage in some other terrorist attack with a proxy in the Persian Gulf. Well, we're back to what essentially was the days where uh, armed escorts are going to have to be the order of the day. And the fact is, is that the United States is playing tag with Iranian naval uh, assets for many years in the Gulf uh, with Iran harassing not only U.S. assets, but also commercial shipping. So, look, uh, it all always goes back to an Iran. And number two, neutralizing the ability of the Houthi rebels to, to dispatch any assets into the Red Sea. That's what it's going to take. And uh, it's going to take a, com com a constant pounding of Houthi assets to force them to back down. You can't just send a tomahawk or 10 minute tomahawks into the Houthi rebel assets that have been done that happened last night. It's going to have to be a multiplier effect. So, Ambassador, when you talk about the fact that it needs to be a multiplier effect, talk to us just about the timeline of that and the ability of the U.S. and its allies to do that at this point. Oh, I think the United States has endless capacity. We have an enormous number of assets. The Eisenhower uh, uh, aircraft task forces in the Red Sea. We have a car carrier jets and other British assets, Australian assets. Uh, look, the Houthis cannot outlast the mm -hmm. ability of this naval flotilla to pound it into submission if it continues to uh, attack uh, commercial shipping. Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this morning. Former White House Middle East advisor and former ambassador to Morocco. Thank you. Sure. Well, taking a quick look at futures, we are about five minutes until the opening bell on Wall Street. Looking at a bit of pressure just below the fly line, it looks like where the Dow could open up the morning, although too, uh, too close to tell at this point. You have the S&P and NASDAQ both uh, looks like pointing to openings to the upside here, some upward movement in futures here this morning. Of course, the movement is following the results that we've gotten from a number of the larger banks here this morning. Record annual profits there from J.P. Morgan, one of the big headlines that we are closely following here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here. We have much more from the opening bell on Wall Street. We'll be right back.
All right, we are about 25 seconds until the opening bell and taking a look at the moves as we count down to the first opening trade here on Wall Street. Investors digesting the latest round of earnings that we've gotten from a number of the larger banks, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, all reporting results this morning. Initially, we saw a negative reaction on some of those banks. They are off the lows of the morning as investors have time to dig a bit deeper and look at the guidance here from some of these larger banks. As we have the opening bell on Wall Street, the final trading day of the week. Again, one of the big stories here is also some of the movements that we're seeing in commodities with oil under a bit of pressure here this morning, Brad. And there is some excitement and another Smith down at the NICE. There we go. There is. My goodness. <laughs> just when you thought you couldn't get enough of them. There's one more. That's just the way Smiths work. <laughs> but, hey, what is up with the fake Funfetti at the NASDAQ? There's no real Funfetti on a Friday? My goodness. All right. Just digital for today. Zoom car ringing the bell there. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the sectors here out of the gate. We've got the movement on the Wi-Fi Interactive. I've got it pulled up on my screen right now. Pulling up the caboose as we start off this Friday going into a holiday trading weekend. Well, holiday weekend. Ain't nobody trading unless it's crypto. Anyway, taking a look at XLY, consumer discretionary that's pulling up the caboose right now. It's down by about four tenths of percent. We'll round that off too. However, take a look at XLE. Out of the gate, it's up by 1.7 percent. We've got a little bit more on that in just a hot second, so stick around for that one. Also, taking a look at the NASDAQ composite, the tech-heavy index. You're seeing the NASDAQ 100, at least here on your screen. We've got Apple higher fractionally out of the gate, four tenths of a percent. Microsoft, about the same, four tenths of a percent. Interesting week for Microsoft. Microsoft actually overtook Apple for a brief moment this week as the most valuable uh, publicly traded U.S. company. Here, So that was interesting to watch take place. We'll continue to watch how they joust for that title. Well, oil prices, we mentioned them a moment ago. They're climbing higher this morning following U.S.-led airstrikes on Yemen's Houthis. We've got team coverage with Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre and Jared Blickery. Inez, we'll begin with you. You're watching Brent this morning. Yeah, that's right. And Brent touching $80 a barrel this morning. Brent has had a tough time going above $78 a barrel. But look, it's not uncommon that we would see a spike of 2 or 3% in one day when we see these Red Sea tensions happening. And we've seen it before. Oil has been range-bound recently, but it has been trading some days up 2%, some days down 2%. Now, with these strikes, regarding these strikes, we have seen that these tensions in the Red Sea are rising again. And we are also seeing that there's a major Danish oil tanker company, Torm. They said that they're stopping their routes via the Red Sea. Why is this important? Well, this company has about 80 vessels that move refined products from refineries to their customers. So they will be stopping those routes via the Red Sea. It's important to note that this Red Sea connects to the Suez Canal. It's the shortest distance between Asia and Europe. Mar last week said that it was going to stop those routes uh, for the foreseeable future. They had temporarily stopped, started again, and now they have stopped again. There's another German giant, also shipping giant, that has said that it will not be going through the Red Sea. Now, what this does is it lengthens their trips because they will have to go through the Cape of Africa. It can lengthen the trip anywhere from 7 to 14 days. So this is why we're seeing oil prices spike today. Nevertheless, I will mention that we have seen some analysts that have lowered their forecast for Brent crude for 2024. And that's because of increasing supply, increasing supply from the U.S. and others. You just had Barclays that lowered their forecast to $85 a barrel for Brent for this year, guys. Yeah, thank you for that, Ines. I'll take it from here. I just want to talk about the oil patch in the United States. And M&A has been the name of the game. We saw a disastrous year last year. Not quite a disaster, but it was not a good year for energy. But we did see some deals announced later in the year. We got Exxon potentially hooking up with Pioneer. We got Chevron and Hess, uh, Occidental and another private company. Um, and we also have Chesapeake and Southwestern. Now, interesting combination. And, and I have some uh, commentary from the street. This really strengthens the play in the natural gas sphere. And let me just read some of this analyst commentary here. Here's Mizuho. Uh, they are upgrading the stock Chesapeake to a buy from neutral price target 104 from 96. This creates a U.S. shale gas powerhouse with operational and marketing flexibility, uh, sees cost savings of at least $400 million annually by 2025. And then here's BMO outperform with a price target of 85. The combination creates a must-own dry gas producer when the market calls for growth to meet LNG. 
cause acid overlap significant and creates the leading dry gas footprint in two basins. So let me just go back to the charts here. Uh, I talked about the difficult year that we saw, and let me just show you on a one-year trailing basis uh, all the red you're seeing on the screen. It's not a lot, but look, Chevron down 16%. As it turns out, Southwest is actually up a little bit, 15% over that time period. But here's the two-year look, and this changes dramatically. We saw oil really outperform. It was the best performing sector by far in 2022. And uh, Exxon up 40% from that time period. Chevron 16%, Occidental Petroleum 67 and Hess 55%. So the name of the game is M&A for this year, I think, in the oil patch. I wouldn't be surprised to see a few more of these deals come about. All right, a situation we're going to continue to watch very closely here. Jared Blickery and Inez Ferre, thanks so much for that team coverage. Switching gears here, let's take a look at one top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance. Tesla, T-S-L-A is the ticker there. EV maker reportedly temporarily halting most production out of its Berlin Gigafactory for the next two weeks, according to Reuters. Yahoo Finance's Prosser Romanian joins us with the details. Hey, Prosser. Hey, dude, Red. So, yeah, that, that disruption in the Red Sea affecting transport through the Suez Canal. So, basically, Tesla presumably has to get these parts from Asia. They go through that channel to Berlin. That's going to be closed now for, well, I mean, right now it's disrupted because of the ongoing operations there. So suppliers got to kind of go around that. Maybe it goes below the, the tip of, of Africa, which is a very, very long and treacherous sort of journey. So they're pausing production there for about a uh, little less than two weeks uh, in Berlin. We're seeing that uh, Berlin isn't the most productive factory Tesla has, but they probably produce around four to 5,000 model wise a week. So that is significant in terms of uh, the, a disruption there, about 10,000 vehicles perhaps. But yeah, it's unsure on the impact in production for the whole quarter, but this is not an insignificant uh, disruption there. So we're seeing this headline put a bit of pressure on shares this morning. We're also getting some news out that Tesla is once again cutting prices mm -hmm. in China on two of its models, I believe. Obviously the pressure here being some concerns about margins and what that could look like in the near term. Yeah, you know, we saw this happen in the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. The price wars are back in China in full effect here. So the Model 3 sedan getting cut by 5.9% to uh, around $34,000 or 246,000 yuan. Uh, the Model Y SUV by 2.8% to around 260,000 yuan or so thereabouts. So yeah, these are not small price cuts. They're actually pretty significant as this sort of market in China is just super competitive. And new vehicles from, from NIO, um, from also from BYD just announced recently at the, at the higher end to where Tesla operates. So not just the cheap EVs, the more expensive ones. And, and this as the industry is going to actually potentially contract next year. The CPAC, which tracks uh, car sales in China, says it might contract by 11% next year mm -hmm. uh, in terms of less small group, but not as much growth as last year. So there is a, more competition and possibly fewer things to buy or fewer customers to buy these products. All right, Pras, thanks so much for the latest on that. Again, a Tesla stock to keep on your radar here this morning throughout the trading day. All right, Pras, thanks. Well, well, let's take a look at United Health because those shares are on the move to the downside, falling nearly 3% in early trading. The move lower here coming after the company reported higher than expected medical costs. The news sparking investors' fears about unanticipated costs and that the fact that that could potentially hit the wider health insurance sector. When you take a look at some of the competitors within this space, when you have names like Humana, uh, CVS, Aetna, among the decliners here this morning on what these results could tell us about the rest of the sector, giving us a read through. We have a number of analysts coming out this morning in reaction to these results. JP Morgan, Cowan, RBC, all warning just about what this tells us about some of the pressure that we could see more broadly speaking throughout the sector here over the course of the weeks when we get more of these results here. But United Healthcare, their, uh, set, their revenue coming in is 70.81 billion, up 12% year over year, topping expectations. And a couple of their other uh, divisions here, the Optum RX revenue, that was up 21% on a year over year basis, coming in at 31.17 billion. Yeah, when we got the CPI print yesterday too, you got the sense, especially from our discussions with Stephen Juno over at Bank of America, that this was going to be one of the stickier areas of inflation, healthcare services, um, and it's beyond just what some of the elective surgeries look like. It is, you know, f dovetailing even further into some of the drugs, whether 
um, needed or desired that people are taking as well. And so uh, all that considered, I think one of the things that jumps out to me from this report for United Health is just the amount of people that are leaning further into some of the health care benefits, the full year revenues, they grew about 12.7% year over year, operating earnings increased about 14.2%, and they also saw the number of consumers served with commercial benefits growing by over 800,000 in 2023. So strong customer response, they're saying, to the company's innovative, affordable benefit offerings. But the affordability, I think, is where even more of those consumers are going to hope that starts to moderate a little bit lower here. Yeah, exactly. And a name to keep on your radar here as we look ahead to some of the other results that we'll be getting from within the insurance sector over the next several weeks. All right, let's get to our stock to watch, and that is BlackRock announcing a big acquisition today, the company buying global infrastructure partners for $12.5 billion. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with more Maddie. The world's biggest uh, asset management firm going big now on airplanes, bridges, tunnels, all things infrastructure. And CEO of BlackRock Larry Fink saying this morning that this is a move to invest in an area where policymakers are getting increasingly interested in expansion. And this to me was a nod to the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States, right? We know that from the federal level, we're seeing more investment in infrastructure and infrastructure updates across the U.S. But governments that are strapped for cash, not just here in the States, but globally, are increasingly seeking private cash to fund those infrastructure projects. And that's what BlackRock is betting on here. The CEO saying that this has the potential to double some of their fees related to these projects. And that's why they decided to go with Global Infrastructure Partners on this $12 billion deal mixed with cash and stock on that expenditure. Now, guys, I want to bring a little bit of context to this because we heard about BlackRock layoffs earlier this week about 600 employees, but that is not the first time we've heard about BlackRock layoffs this year. And the stock tends to dip when we hear of this layoff news. This news today is exactly why we see these firms doing things with cost cutting and layoffs. We're seeing the exact same thing over at City with their cost reduction plan. And then we see them spending money in other ways moving forward. That's one potential explanation for the layoffs that we've seen from BlackRock. The firm continues to say that the push towards passive versus active management of funds and things like ETFs from retail investors is weighing on some of their profit margins when it comes to some of their employees. And instead, they're going to cut back on those employees and invest in firms like this one. Madison, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, we've got more on Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief. We're going to break down the latest market moves with New Edge Wealth's Ben Emmons. That's next.
All right, J.P. Morgan City, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America kicking off earnings season this morning. J.P. Morgan coming out on top, at least for now, raking in a record $49 billion in net income. The stock gaining just around 2% here at the open, had been up nearly 2.5%. That was the largest gain that we've seen in nearly a month. So here with more on what these early results tell us about the rest of the earnings season and some of the movements that we could see in the broader market, we want to bring in Ben Edmonds. He is New Edge Wealth Senior Portfolio Manager. Ben, it's great to have you back here in studio. So let's talk about these results. Your takeaway from some of the strength that we saw from these banks and what that tells us then in terms of setting the tone for earnings season. Yeah, I think the uh, the FDIC charge was a bit of the, let's say, the headline dampener. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look into... JP Morgan being such an incredible machine, particularly wealth management business now reaching like 3.4 trillion in assets. And the other banks like Morgan Stanley and Goldman are, are you know, obviously big in that area too. So I think that sets us up for earnings season for those as in they're trying to gain market share there. Probably good results there potentially on that front. Whereas with Bank of America and, and uh, Wells Fargo this morning, there was some increase in charge offs on, on loans that are getting a little bit sour here. So that's, I think, why those stocks were down and taking obviously that hit from FDIC. It does come to roost ultimately, right? The regional banking crisis may have subsided, but the banks, the big banks, have to pay for it. So I think also Morgan Stanley probably has some of that and, and Goldman next week. So I think it's a mix to good picture, mm -hmm. um, but it's not really the driver today, though, for the market. It's really energy that's, that's really yeah. about. Does those loans running sour signal to you that the resiliency in household balance sheets in some of the small business balance sheets might be coming to a close? It could be, but I, I, I think it's still early days because it's amazing how the, the call it the Fed rate shock, is, is not yet caught up with the economy in, a, in such a significant way. You know, a different era, area of this, just to briefly highlight, is private credit, where, you know, there's interest, there's a lot of money going into private credit, and interest there is very high, and it hits really the economy on the, on the ground, right? As in, you have small companies that use private credit lenders, and there's no distress seen there. So I wonder if, if we're living with high rates, and we're able to live with high rates, that that's really continues to be the environment that we're in, that these charge-offs are just small impairments as opposed to a broadening uh, distress cycle. But I want to go back to what you just said a moment ago, and that was just in terms of the fact that energy really the driver of the markets, at least for today. When you see the spike in oil, the threat of escalating tensions in the Mideast, how are you evaluating that as a portfolio manager, as a strategist here, in terms of some of the uncertainty or volatility that we're likely to see in the coming weeks? Well, this coordinated attack is definitely an escalation. Before, it was all just a lot of noise out of that region. And, you know, the Houthis have always been in that area active and doing something very on a very local scale. So getting now a coordinated attack by countries is, is I think, an, uh, you know, an elevated moment here. Now, Iran will be, still be very carefully trying to test the waters. Mm -hmm. Lots of discussion about whether they could actually disrupt shipping in, in the Strait of Hormuz, right, which would be, the, I think, the big event for energy markets. But Iran is also going to shoot itself in the foot if it does, because it, there's about a million, a million barrels of Iranian oil going through that strait. So what I think, what as a portfolio manager, I take from it is one, yes, there will be some pressure on energy prices here, because there's some risk premium built in there. Mm -hmm. Because really, you're seeing oil tankers taking a detour from these canals, and that will lengthen the time of delivering oil, and that was repriced. Same thing with those other shipping companies. So it will show up a little bit in the supply chain again, mm -hmm. but it will not show up in our inflation numbers, you know, because if you look at PPI this morning, that's all soft still, that's all still past supply normalization. They will take actually maybe a few months before we actually see the true macro effects from the current events. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too that the markets are not taking this as a flight to safety moment. The only two sectors are up are gold and energy. And I think gold is maybe because of people thinking of the Strait of Hormuz and mm -hmm using it as, okay, that could be a tail risk. Mm -hmm. Energy, obviously, because people are trying to discount, what does this really mean for supply? Uh, against the backdrop of a, a China that could used to have a record import of energy, but being a really sluggish economy, if you've seen the deflationary numbers overnight. What is the best trade for someone who is trying to perhaps uh, mitigate their portfolio from some of these exogenous risks then? 
Yeah, this will be the year, I think, of, of diversifying in, the, in defense. Um, you know, and, and it could be different things, though. It's not necessarily always healthcare and utilities that people choose, sure. mm -hmm. even though they're, you know, maybe in some ways valuation-wise interesting versus tech. We really, I mean, tech actually could be a really good defense play here, and show, so far showing that tech is actually not relenting uh, in any way. But I think the, the other uh, environment is really about how gold will, I think, behave and Bitcoin now too, because I think people do look at tangibles in an environment like that. You know, gold being, it is actually getting stimulus from flight to safety, but also gets stimulus from future easing of the Fed. And then you have obviously now the events around Bitcoin being more institutionalized in an ETF product. Um, you know, people look at this as a diversification against however this energy shock will play out, if it happens, uh, you know, what that then will mean for conventional assets like stocks and bonds. I think, yeah, being playing def defense in, in Bitcoin and gold is, is an interesting play. All right. Ben, thanks so much for taking the time here. As always, great to see you in studio. You. On a, even on a Friday, yeah. makes his way into the <laughs> office here. Ben Emmons, New Edge Wealth Senior Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for taking the time. Coming up, we've got more Yahoo Finance Morning Brief. Burberry shares getting hit after issuing a stark warning on profit. Ooh, that spells out trouble for the wellies out there. We'll break down those moves next. Shares of Burberry hit after the high-end retailer slashed its profit forecast after weak holiday sales. The profit warning is the brand's second in three months, a sign that luxury demand is in for a tough 2024, perhaps. We're here with more, joined by Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. Hey, Brooke. Good morning, Brad. This is certainly yet another setback for the Burberry brand as the, as the luxury re, uh, retail brand continues to move forward with its new strategy to really broaden its appeal through more modern luxury aesthetic and lean into its British roots. It's now under the creative guidance of English fashion designer Daniel Lee. His first collection launched in September, but Burberry not immune to the ongoing uh, consumer environment where they continue to tighten their wallet and pull back on these luxury goods goods and in this in the release of Burberry CEO saying that the company is continuing to deliver the transition to our new modern British luxury creative expression for Burberry 
but he said it has become more challenging against that backdrop of a slowing luxury demand. The company now expects adjusted operating profit for the fiscal year to come in between $523 million to $587 million. Now, that is down from the previous guidance of $704 to $852 million. Its fiscal year does end March 30th. This demand is being led by a slower demand here in the Americas, down 15 percent, followed by Europe, the Middle East, India and Africa, down 5 percent and Asia Pacific sales they're up three percent but what we continue to see there is a softer demand post COVID in China. Brooke, how does the results that we're seeing from Burberry how does that stack up to some of the other luxury retailers within this space so yeah. are, are they seeing similar trends? Yeah well it's certainly been a tough year for LVMH of course that's behind Christian Dior, Fendi, Louis Vuitton they were driven a lower by sales here in the U.S. after exceptional growth during pandemic and what we're really learning here is that post pandemic we saw a meaningful growth story for the luxury market but now we're seeing a bit of a pullback when I spoke to the luxury retail CEO of Neiman Marcus, he said that the luxury market is experiencing a normalization and it's really led by this aspirational consumer. What we're seeing here is consumers waiting for the right time and the right price to act on purchasing these luxury goods. And Brooke, we're also going to hear more this week and from some of the biggest names in retail as right. well. What are we expecting? What's going to come forward? And you're going to be tracking all of this. Yeah, well, we'll certainly be at the NRF conference this coming weekend. The NRF Expo is setting down here in New York City. And last year, more than 35,000 thousand attendees uh, were, were went there. There was more than 6,000 brands per, uh, presenting. We're also expecting a similar turnout this year. And really some key themes that we expect this year is navigating this uncertain environment, the future of retail. I'm sure AI will come up many, many times. But really the evolution of luxury is something that I'm going to be keeping a close watch on, as well as among, among many other topics. I'm eager to hear what these execs have to say about the state of the consumer and what they expect for 2024. It's a really fun event as well. I mean, there was some technology that was showcased last time I went there that really sh showed off the kind of picking and packing. So there is like the robotics element. There's also the big brands and the CEOs that make their way there. But there's there's a big technology aspect to this Absolutely. as well. It's going to be yeah, interesting. Lots of investment in automation in the past year. And so I expect that to move forward. I'm sure it'll be a big topic as well. And Brooke's going to be all over it for us uh, coming up here on Yahoo Finance this weekend. But next week, Rick is going to be uh, covering more on the state of retail. And coming up later on in the show, we are going to be speaking with Nate Check it. He is the CEO and founder of activewear brand Roan. He's joining us 1040 a.m. Eastern time later on today. Let's get to our vibe on the street. We're around just about 26 minutes into the second trading day here for Spot Bitcoin ETS. We certainly saw a lot of excitement surrounding the listing debut of these products yesterday. The U.S. listed Bitcoin ETFs see more than $4 billion worth of shares traded with Grayscale, BlackRock, Fidelity, dominating the headlines, dominating some of that market volume here yesterday. So we did see Bitcoin ETFs, I think it's fair to say, get off to a very solid, encouraging monster start here for Wall Street. There was an interesting development during yesterday's trading day. The fact that Vanguard saying that it will not offer spot Bitcoin funds on its platform. And I bring this up because this points to some of the uncertainty, some of the volatility, some of the fact that to some extent, not all on Wall Street have confidence in this product yet, have confidence in crypto, the way it trains it, the sustainability of what this is going to be like for individual investors. So keeping that all in mind, I think that points to the fact that there's still lots of uncertainty surrounding the debut of these products. But judging by the volume yesterday, there clearly is a demand for Bitcoin spot ETFs. What that demand looks like following this pent-up debut, I think is really what investors need to keep on their radar next week. And some of the largest fund managers that are getting involved within this move here. I was just taking a look, and any of our viewers can check out this particular historical data section on the Yahoo Finance platform. And even if you were to look up, say, uh, GBTC, which of course we were just speaking with, our own Julie Hyman was speaking with Michael Sonnenschein yesterday on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as they essentially were able to make that conversion following the SEC's approval. 56 million was the, was the volume that we saw there. So big pop on volume there. Also, 
iShares that rang the opening bell at the NASDAQ, the iShares, iShares Bitcoin Trust, iBit, IBIT, that saw 36 uh, 37.6 million in volume. And then additionally, we interviewed Valkyrie earlier this week as well. They saw a pop in volume on yesterday. So the larger question is, what is the long tail of some of that volume? Where do we start to average out at from here? Too? Yeah, Valkyrie is seeing about 9 million of shares uh, exchanging hands yesterday. And really what the read through of some of the numbers that you were just citing, some of the numbers here that we're seeing from the other Bitcoin products uh, ETF products is what that's going to tell us about the winners and losers within this category. Obviously, some are going to be at more of an, an advantage than others. A lot of that coming down to fees. So, of course, in terms of what investors favor here over the coming weeks will be very telling about some of the uh, opportunity here in the long term. Well, we are going to be diving deeper into this historic week. It's been for Bitcoin with the spot ETF approvals. Got a guest coming up in the next hour. Sandy Call, Franklin Templeton's head of digital asset investor advisory services, will be joining us next hour for more on her take of what this means for the broader crypto, broader crypto market. So we'll be bringing that to you next hour. Well, coming up, Delta shares in the red after the airline company cut its full year guidance. We are going to be speaking with Third Bridge's Peter McNally next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 32 minutes into the start of today's trading activity. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks mixed as earnings season kicks off. Big bank results, Delta, United Healthcare. What more could you ask for? Strap in, there's much more. This standout morning was JP Morgan. The, the standout this morning was, which pulled away from the pack with record high profits. All right, take a look at some of those individual names. We've got more earnings in the banking sector. Bank of New York Mellon also releasing results, a 50% drop in fourth quarter profit. Now, this coming after some one-time charges, including fees tied to the FDIC's in deposit insurance fund, a similar trend to what we saw from the larger banks here this morning as well. Still, though, the stock rising up just about 3%. Higher assets under management and interest revenue here is two things that the street is encouraged about from these results. And Qualcomm also moving higher today on an upgrade from City to buy from neutral. The analyst saying he's confident in the recovery of the handset market, writing in a note to clients that inventory replenishment continues in the handset space, which should benefit both revenue and margins at Qualcomm. 
And more, more good news on the street. Twilio surging after an upgrade on Piper Sandler to overweight. Now the analysts saying that now that they now see, quote, material upside for the stock as the company has executed better on profitability initiatives. You're looking at gains of just about three and a half percent. Well, shares of Delta Airlines falling this morning after reporting full year guidance that disappointed the street. I spoke to CEO Ed Bastian ahead of these results about the company's outlook for fiscal year 2024. Here's what he had to say. You're looking for the year uh, uh, to come in at between six and seven dollars a share. We've had some delays over the course of the last couple of years in the supply chain. Uh, maintenance costs uh, are higher as well as the, the performance, the turn time performance is also slower and uh, salaries and inflation has also have also been much higher than was anticipated uh, a couple of years ago. Bastion continued to say that he feels good that the company could get to that $7 number next year, but that doesn't seem to be enough for the street as of right now. Street also factoring in a few other things. Let's bring in Peter McNally, who's the third bridge global sector lead for industrials, materials, and energy. Peter, great to speak with you as always here. Would love to get some of your insight around what the street might be fading within this report here. Well, I think it's the realization that after three years of a strong recovery, we're leveling off here, you know, and I would say for Delta specifically, they actually have a few things going their way that other airlines don't. Like one, they're not incredibly dependent on deliveries of new aircraft. I mean, sure, they have some, uh, but, you know, expectations for the number of seats aren't you know, quite as high as others. Two, they've got, uh, you know, a pretty good maintenance program while there is inflation, okay, and uh, delays on this stuff. Delta's a bit more immune than than their competitors, given this Delta tech ops business that they, that they have. Um, it's a fairly unique asset. So I think this is the, you know, start of investors just realizing that, hey, this is going to be uh, not a super great year in 2024, but still pretty healthy. So we're seeing a sell off this morning. So when it comes to the reaction, is this maybe a bit of an overreaction to some extent, especially if maybe Delta is better positioned than some of its rivals within the space? Well, the shares have just kind of been in the middle of this like 32 to 47 range. Maybe we're getting a little, little high on that. Now it's just coming back in the middle um, and things will settle out uh, as we as we go forward. Yeah, you know, there are you know, some threats, particularly in the domestic market, where a lot of capacity has been added. Um, but Delta is not wholly tied to that. Um, you know, real the upside is if we get a full recovery in Asia and more than just one really good summer in Europe, which you know drove the results this year. It was a big big factor getting getting that that recovery. If you know if those markets continue to go, um, Delta's in a pretty good position. But there are some things really weighing on the on the U.S. leisure travel market uh, that are going to hit some airlines that haven't performed as well, you know, more so than Delta. You know, Peter, in my conversation with Ed, he, he reminded that this is not a company that operates the MAX currently. Uh, they do have deliveries set for 2025 for the Dash 10. However, they did just announce a massive order as well with Airbus. So... All these things considered, where might we be starting to see some inclinations of, of shifting sentiment from airline operators, even in the wake of what took place with Boeing last weekend for some of these large plane orders? Look, demand has not been a problem in, in this industry. It's actually meeting that demand with, with supply, is getting the right number of planes in the right place at the right time to serve customers, right? So that's a pretty healthy backdrop. And I think Delta this morning is backing that up with 20 new orders of the A350. So, you know, that has not changed. But what happened last week for Boeing, and I know it's getting a lot of airtime here, is just one more example of the supply chain problems in this industry. It is the one big industry where these things haven't been solved. You know, there's plenty of inventory around for semiconductors and cars and, and, and things like that. But getting aircraft is difficult. And, you know, it's not just a Boeing problem. We, we start, saw this summer the Pratt & Whitney 1100 engine, you know, has to go in for service of these, new, these newer engines. And those are a lot of those are found on the Airbus A321, which Delta does fly. Where Delta has an advantage 
is again, this Delta Tech Ops business that they do have, they can service it themselves. But other carriers, let's just take JetBlue as an example, they have to contract somebody. And those people are really busy and it's gonna take time to get those planes you know, inspected, fixed, and back in, in the air. So those are just some of the challenges that are ongoing. I know the 730, yeah, 7 Max 9 had a very high profile, you know, issue last week. And thank God it didn't end in, you know, tragically. Yeah. But it is just one example of the supply chain challenges in this industry. So Peter, talking about the supply chain challenges, talking about the fact that a number of these challenges happen time and time again, although this the circumstance, the situation obviously very different than what we have seen in the past. But when we talk about that being a, such a big headwind for these airlines, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Or when you talk about the fact that this is a challenge, for how long and to what extent is that going to hold back future earnings? Well, the experts at Thurbridge have pointed out that these issues really are happening on new aircraft. Um, it's companies with well-maintained, you know, reliable uh, planes that work that like they're doing well and, and they're meeting demand. It's the expectations of growth is where you run into trouble and, and delivering that growth is going to be the hardest thing, you know, in this industry. You know, United was the most aggressive of the major airlines in 2023 in terms of getting more planes and meeting demand. You know, the middle of 2021, they placed a big, big, big order, biggest order in the company's history, you know, with Boeing. Um, and they didn't quite get enough planes in, in 2023. So they cut expectations. So these are the, you know, this is the big challenge. When you're reliant on new planes, that's going to be the most difficult part of the, you know, of the industry. Peter, we heard some of the buy on the dip mentality reemerge towards the tail end of 2023. Is this a dip that investors can feel, feel comfortable buying into with Delta shares here today as we're seeing them down by about 6%? Well, look, I think it's going to get pretty choppy for the rest of the industry. Delta's got a few things going, you know, going their way uh, longer term. But if you believe in the international recovery, you know, and you believe that Delta is going to be able to maintain their planes, which, you know, the track record is pretty good, they're likely to outperform their peers. Um, you know, some of the peers are going to struggle a bit more in getting new planes and having maintenance work done. And again, the leisure travel in the U.S. is seeing some pressure, mm -hmm. okay, that there have been planes added into that industry and pricing has started to roll a bit. But again, if you believe international and the ability to keep planes running and in the air, tell us not a bad spot. All right, Peter McNally, always great to get your insight, especially on a day like today. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here. Third Bridge, a global sector lead for industrials and materials as well as energy. Thanks, Peter. Take care. Alaska Airlines passengers suing the aerospace company Boeing, putting pressure on shares today. They're off another one and a half percent. Alexis Keenan is here now with the latest on this lawsuit. Alexis. Hi, Shauna. This lawsuit filed in Washington State Court yesterday. It's a proposed class action brought by seven passengers of that Alaska Airlines flight. The plaintiffs say that Boeing is liable for defects in construction of that 737 MAX 9 and that Boeing either delivered the plane without securing that door plug or used defective bolts to hold that door in place. Now, the plaintiffs are asking for unspecified damages and Boeing is declining to respond to this suit, but I think it can be best understood by simply reading from the complaint. Plaintiff's lawyers have a flair usually for dramatic language, but in this case, we'll make an exception here. I'm going to read directly from what this lawsuit says. The plaintiffs say that the force of the de- pressurization ripped the shirt off of a boy and sucked cell phones, debris, and much of the oxygen out of the aircraft. The entire seat back of 26A, as well as the headsets in seats 26A and 26B were torn off and expelled into the night. The shirtless boy leapt over the woman next to him and escaped toward the front of the plane. Other passengers seated near the hole followed suit and found seats closer to the front. As for injuries, these plaintiffs say that the event physically injured some passengers and emotionally traumatized most, if not all, on board. The violence, they say, of the event bruised the bodies of some and that that pressure change made ears bleed. And with combined low ox oxygen, low wind noise, and traumatic stress made heads ache severely, the passengers 
say they were shocked, terrorized, and confused, hoping they would live long enough to walk the earth again. Now, the complaint goes on to allege that, quote, many of the oxygen masks did not seem to work. We have no confirmation one way or the other on that allegation. Uh, also, these plaintiffs noting those three alerts that went on in that aircraft with Alaska Air before this event occurred. Uh, so uh, probably not the first lawsuit we can expect to be filed here in this case, a long road ahead for perhaps for these passengers as well as for Boeing. Yeah, guys. Alexis, hearing that account, hearing the description and, and the filing, and then additionally seeing the video, I mean, it really just makes your heart pump out your chest and give you only even a small sliver of what those who were on board must have been going through uh, and the stress, the traumatic stress that they endured here. Alexis, thanks so much for continuing to follow this story for us. Appreciate it. You bet. Coming up, it's day two of trading for spot Bitcoin ETFs. We're going to speak with Franklin Templeton on the other side of the short break. This morning, Franklin Templeton cutting the fee on its spot, a Bitcoin ETF, and now making it the lowest amongst all current issuers. The manager will also waive fees until the fund reaches $10 billion in assets under management. Now, the newly approved spot Bitcoin ETFs as a group saw $4.6 billion in volume in the first day of trading. We want to bring in Sandy Call. She's Franklin Templeton's head of digital asset and investor advisory services here. Sandy, it's great to see you. Let's start with the news out this morning. Uh, Franklin Templeton, you are once again now becoming the cheapest option out there on the street in terms of the spot Bitcoin uh, ETF. Talk to us or walk us through your strategy and how you, you are sticking out and what is has become and will likely even become a more crowded market. Yeah, so great to be here. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, we really believe so deeply uh, in the potential of the new digital asset space. This is something that Franklin Templeton has been investing in for over five years now. Uh, we were the first asset manager to have a uh, registered mutual fund on the blockchain. And this Bitcoin ETF is an exciting new addition to our overall product suite. And we want to be as competitive as possible. We think that this provides a new type of alternative exposure that investors can have in their portfolio uh, that can really help to diversify their portfolio and give them exposure to a whole new area of technology and growth. 
uh, where innovation is happening every day. So we want this to be as easy uh, to access as possible. That's why we have our ticker Easy BC, and we want our investors to really be as incentivized as possible uh, to invest with us, which is why we want our fees to be the most competitive that we can afford to offer as an asset manager. Yeah, Sandy, we've seen some creative Bitcoin ETF tickers out there. Yours is certainly among them. So ultimately here, we're taking a look at some of the fees and this is where it gets a little bit more competitive too. What goes into that calculus as a lot of potential investors are trying to wade through who has got the best fee, what these commissions really mean and where they should place their money? Yeah, well, offering these uh, Bitcoin ETFs do involve somewhat higher costs than traditional stock or bond or even gold and commodity ETFs, simply because the custody arrangements that you need to think about, both for the cash and for the Bitcoin, uh, require some nuances that aren't really necessary in some of the more uh, well-known products. So there's a little bit higher cost that we as an asset manager have to absorb. Uh, and therefore, what we think about is where do we expect uh, to raise assets, how much assets do we expect to raise? We're very optimistic about our product, given our really deep involvement uh, with the digital natives in the space and our really great positioning as a trusted name in asset management. So we have confidence over the long run that we will raise more than enough assets to be able to offer this really uh, strong incentive early on to our customers. Uh, and that this will be made up for in the long run. But we have to kind of weigh it all off against how much it costs to run the fund uh, and maintain proper discipline. So those are kind of the calculations that go into our thinking. Cindy, we've seen a varying uh, receptance here just in terms of reaction, I should say, on Wall Street as to how open some of these uh, firms are to uh, giving their clients access to these Bitcoin ETS Vanguard. One of the firms coming out and saying that they will not be allowing clients, most of their clients here, to buy Bitcoin ETFs. I'm curious your perspective on that and what that's going to do here in terms of confidence amongst investors of buying into these products. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, there's sometimes a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, about what the digital asset space represents. Uh, a lot of people think about the very early days of Bitcoin when it was really operating under the regulatory perimeter and when there really wasn't much uh, oversight in terms of what was happening. And there were bad actors that took advantage of that lack of oversight in the early years of its launch. Uh, but we have really seen a significant uptick in the amount of engagement around the world in terms of these new assets like Bitcoin. Uh, we have regulations coming out in many regions of the world. Uh, we're working here in the United States to put in our own regulation and think about what might be required to participate in this space. We've really put into place regulatory tools that are able uh, to monitor wallet activity and really understand when bad actors try and come into the space. So I think there's been a lot of advancement that a lot of people who aren't paying attention to the space may not be aware of. And they may harbor some uh, early concerns from what Bitcoin kind of accumulated as a reputation in its very early years of operation. But a lot of that really has been put to rest. And now this really does represent a network that is creating trillions of dollars of value. Uh, we've actually seen uh, now more transactions in Bitcoin uh, than we've seen in Visa or in MasterCard in a given year. So these are, are pretty substantial ecosystems that are growing very dynamically, and they haven't been accessible except for through going directly into the cryptocurrency itself until these Bitcoin ETFs launched. And that's what's so exciting about this new product. Sandy, it's only uh, the second day of trading, but the initial uh, reaction and excitement amongst investors, obviously something uh, to be very encouraged about. And that brings me to what is next for this space, right? Lots of talk about after the launch of these products, could we see another uh, more spot products here for other crypto products? How likely do you think that is? Well, if you think about the innovation that's happening, um, there's a lot of places where we're seeing that unfold, right? When you think about companies and platform companies, you see lots of companies involved in the platform space, right? And these are network uh, economies that they're running, but they're being operated by private companies. Bitcoin is a platform network, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. So there's not a company that owns it. And when you think about other equivalent businesses that are growing very dynamically, you have Ethereum, you have Solana, you have Polygon, you have other 
uh, blockchains and you have other ecosystems in the crypto space that are all really creating value uh, within their own uh, uh, participants. They have entrepreneurs building applications in these areas. They're introducing new technologies like Oracle networks. They're using smart contracts, which are self-executing code. This is really the next generation of platform economies. Um, and we will probably over time see many of these opportunities become available to everyday investors through, uh, uh, through wrappers like an ETF that they find easy to utilize. Thank you so much for joining us. Sandy Call, who is the Franklin Templeton Head of Digital Asset and Investor Advisory Services. Great breakdown there on all things that we've been tracking around the Bitcoin ETF launches this week. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, we've been bringing you coverage as well all week from CES in Las Vegas. Stay tuned for our interview with the CEO of Goodyear next. I'm Akiko Fujita on the ground here in Las Vegas at CES 2024, where we're talking about intelligent tires. We've got Rich Kramer here, the CEO and president of Goodyear, in front of this great display here. I mean, you've got so many tires here, but let's talk about uh, Goodyear Sightline. This is something that you introduced a few years ago. Correct. Intelligent <laughs> tires, how does it work? So, excuse me, and, and by the way, thanks for having us, and, and it's great to be here, great to have you at our booth here today. So, intelligent tires are really about taking all the information that we can get out of that tire and bring it into the vehicle driving systems. And the way we think about it is we look at how mobility is changing today. We're really moving from what's been sort of a hardware-centric vehicle to a software-based vehicle, where we have essentially a software-centric vehicle that's really an electric device on wheels that gets you to a software defined vehicle where functions and all the features are essentially coming from a software based solution. We're taking that same thing and creating a software defined tire if you will and what we do by get, getting the tire characteristics and the road characteristics using some proprietary data we have around the tires, using sensors and using sensors to take road conditions, we're able to sort of amalgamate that information and, and measure both tire, excuse me, the temperature and pressure of a tire, but also wear and load and ultimately friction, or in other words, what's happening at the base of the road and the tire 
taking all that information and bringing it back to vehicle driving systems to improve the safety and performance of those vehicles. Essentially make them safer and have them perform better on whatever use case they're in. So we're talking about communication between the tire itself, the system in there, and the car. Exactly. Uh, when you talk about safety specifically, what, what are we talking about? Is it about the tire pressure that you mentioned? Is it about letting the vehicle know about the road conditions so they know to stop earlier? Well, e exactly. And maybe one of the best demonstrations of that is uh, one of the things we announced was work that we're doing with TNO into their ABS brake systems. And what we've demonstrated in there by providing that tire intelligence into those ABS braking systems, we can actually show the vehicle stopping at around six feet more than it otherwise would. And that's really because, as you said, bringing that information, that real-time information, into those vehicle driving systems. So, for instance, if the tire is worn, if it's overloaded, if it's underinflated, and it's on a wet road, we can assess that real-time and then bring that into the vehicle driving systems to make that vehicle stop or perform more optimally than if, if those systems saw, thought that the tire was actually brand new. So we've got you right behind you, this truck, Gaddick. This is a partner of Goodyear a fully self-driving truck for the middle mile, which in many ways is the most important, right? Exactly. Can you talk to me about how that intelligent tire communicates with a truck with no driver in it? Well, it, you know, it's probably the best example that we have because when there is a driver, obviously the driver can compensate for some of those conditions. But when there is no driver, as you mentioned in Gaddock, we can actually take that, we take that information and actually advise directly those driving systems so it does everything I mentioned earlier. But what's even more important for a company like Gaddock as they expand their business, we can improve their cost per mile, we can improve their uptime as they do those deliveries, and what Intelligence can do for them, Intelligent Tire can do for them, is increase their use cases. So not only can they operate in a sunny environment with dry pavement, but they can also operate now where the roads may be wet, where the roads may be icy, where there's snow on the roads, and again, with no driver in the vehicle, the most important element that they're getting is what's happening on the road to advise those driving systems. That's what we can do for them. So it's a win-win for them in terms of their business model, in terms of safety, and in terms of their expansion. What does it mean for mileage? Pardon me? What does it mean for mileage? Uh, so the mileage will generally come from the tire that we put on there and the, uh, the type of tread compounds that we do. So we have a fit for purpose tire that we're working with Gaddock to put on those vehicles that will give them the best performance in terms of mileage, in terms of durability, and in terms of, uh, of giving them all the things they need to deliver their mission. You know, you, you walk the floor here at CES, and, and especially in the auto space, we keep hearing about vehicles being software defined. You Correct. just mentioned that as well. Essentially, we're talking about a machine on wheels. It's not the, your traditional vehicle. How has that shifted the way Goodyear thinks about its tires? It's a, you know, it's a really great, great question because we look at this and we see this change happening in mobility. And for us, it's going from creating a really an important part of a vehicle, a tire, but moving from a passive uh, a piece that goes on a tire and gets bolted on a tire to something that's actually integrated into those vehicle driving systems. So it creates a more, uh, uh, probably more than ever in our history, it creates an integral role of the tire into those driving systems rather than just that sort of piece that's bolted on it. So we're not just talking about obviously intelligent tires, we've got a number of tires here. The airless tire in the back is an interesting one for me, but also you've really been working with EV companies to, to, to give the full sustainability, Correct. not just with those. What kind of challenge does that present for you? So, so we introduced here at, at CES our new uh, 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 tire specifically meant for EVs, and that tire, the Electric Drive 2, sort of hits on all the elements on a fit-for-purpose EV tire. It gives better rolling resistance to increase range. It has foam and tire to reduce the noise. It has the load to be able to carry a heavier vehicle in an EV because of the battery pack. And what we did is put a 60,000 mile warranty on it to create more durability into the tire because that's what consumers like because of the power that goes directly to those wheels from electric motors. So what we've done is created a tire that's sort of going to meet the demands of EV users. And you mentioned the airless tire, it's sort of the same thing. We're more and more creating fit for purpose tires to do the job that's needed to be done in this new world of mobility. 
a, a, an EV tire for a robo taxi, let's say, that eventually might go uh, in Chicago from Lincoln Park down to the Loop. It's going to go sort of up and back at slow speeds, making few turns. That tire can be designed in a more efficient, sustainable way uh, versus the ones they're using today, which might be speed rated at 120 miles an hour and might be sort of over constructed for the use. This lets us create those fit for purpose tires also in a more sustainable way. And finally, Rich, since we're talking about the unique needs of EVs, the Cybertruck among them, you're designing the tires for this, or you've been designing the tires for them. Um, what kind of challenge does that present to you? I mean, we sort of, you look at the Cybertruck, certainly not your standard EV. So, you know, so we love all our OE customers and certainly Tesla is one of the leading EV companies as we know and the Cybertruck is right on the, on the front edge of that as well. So for us, uh, that OE tire, that original equipment tire was really fit for what Tesla wanted to get out of that. So that goes into the design and construction of the tire, including some tire intelligence that's in it, but also to the cosmetics of it, which you and I chatted about before, where it fits perfectly sort of with the rim package they have. So you get the performance they want, plus the optics that make the, tire, the Cybertruck look so cool. Rich Kramer, President and CEO of Goodyear. Really good to talk to you on the Thank board you, tonight. Thank you, and thanks for having Thank us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, our thanks to Goodyear, our thanks to Kiko Fujita, who has been out at CES live in Las Vegas all week for us here at Yahoo Finance. Well, coming up next, we've got the co-founder and CEO of men's clothing company, Roan, as inflation proves stubbornly sticky. How is the activewear brand best positioning itself for the year ahead? We've got more on that next. From iPhones and iPads to Macs, Apple Watches, and AirPods, Apple's products are a daily necessity for millions, and the numbers prove it. The company generated more than $394 billion in revenue in 2022 alone. But how were they able to achieve such staggering success? Beyond the ticker charts its path to becoming a tech giant. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple in Los Altos, California in 1976. That same year, Wozniak built the company's first product, the Apple One. Apple debuted the Macintosh with its now iconic 1984 commercial during Super Bowl 18. The Macintosh stood out because it was the first mass market personal computer to feature a graphical user interface and mouse. Jobs left Apple after his famous falling out with CEO John Scully in 1985 and subsequently founded the next computer company. In 1991, Apple introduced the PowerBook line, which set the standard for most modern laptops. In 1996, after a run of CEOs, Jobs returned to Apple. The company purchased Next to use its operating system and named Jobs interim CEO in 1997. Apple introduced the iMac in 98, and the line would go on to sell millions of units. Three years later, Apple debuted its first iPod, which could store roughly a thousand songs. In that same year, the company opened its first Apple stores. But it was in 2007 that Apple unveiled its most important product of all, the iPhone. A revolutionary device, the iPhone helped create an entire business model around apps and the App Store. Jobs suffered from pancreatic cancer towards the end of his second term as CEO. He resigned from the company just before his death, and Tim Cook took over as CEO in 2011. In 2015, Apple took the wraps off of its first new device since Cook took over as head of Apple, the Apple Watch. Just seven years later, Apple became the world's first publicly traded company to reach a market cap of $3 trillion. And in June 2023, the company unveiled its most ambitious product yet, the Vision Pro. A mixed reality headset, the Vision Pro is scheduled to launch in early 2024.
Perhaps your weekend forecast includes athleisure. Value conscious consumers may feel more propensity to spend on goods that have a longer life on their shelves. So where do clothing retailers fit in all of this? Nate Checkets, Raoon founder and CEO, is here to discuss more. Nate, always a pleasure to see you. I've even seen you on some marketing materials recently too. So showing off and flexing the modeling muscles. I see that over there. So uh, I took a lot of convincing, Brad. <laughs> you look good, you look good. Uh, it's always great to catch up with you. You know, as we're really evaluating this consumer right now that we've heard from time and time again from some of the retail CEOs and athleisure manufacturers like yourself, the consumer is looking for value. They are looking for value hacks, but they're also looking for quality in this too. How are you seeing that mindset play through within your touch points with Roan buyers? I think what we've seen is that consumers are still spending. They're just being far more selective about how they're spending their money and what they're investing in. So to your point, they're buying less products, but they're buying high quality products because they're looking at it as an investment. And, uh, and for us, we always focus, uh, we hyper-focus on quality. So it bodes well for us in terms of the pieces that, uh, that we give and provide to customers. In fact, we were just ranked in one of the top 20 brands to watch. And the only negative on us was that our products tend to be a little bit expensive, but it was in exchange for the value and the quality that you get. It's really about the return on investment, just like anything else. And Nate, it is a very tough uh, and crowded market right now. When you talk about promotional activity, yes, maybe your products are a bit more expensive, but how have you navigated that, especially at a time like this, when there is so much uncertainty and some consumers are pulling back on their spending? Part of it is just talking about all of the benefits. So for example, our commuter shirt, um, which retails at $138, you never have to take it to the dry cleaners. So if you're used mm -hmm. to going and paying for the dry cleaners, this shirt will pay for itself in a very short period of time. So explaining and walking the customers through, not only are you gonna be more comfortable, it's gonna fit you better, you can sweat in it, you can you, know, you can do anything in this shirt, uh, but you're, it, it's also a value play. You're gonna save money in the long run. And so with all of that in mind, you think about the different SKUs that you have, the different inventory, and, and how you're best equipped for continuing to engage with this consumer right now. What, what is the consumer telling you that they want more optionality of right now? Because, I mean, I tell you what, my set game right now is, is great. I got the hoodies. I got the sweatpants. I, I feel like yep. there are many people that might You're be You're always on category. trend. I'm trying. I'm trying. I can vouch for that. I'm trying, Nate. Yeah, <laughs> always on trend. Sets are definitely in right now. Um, we are seeing just increased demand for versatility, the ability to wear products in multiple different use cases, uh, multiple different scenarios. But we are launching a number of different new active products this year that we're incredibly excited about that we spent a long time developing. We started as an active brand. And so for us to be able to kind of refresh our active is really exciting because the customers have been asking uh, us for that for a while. All this talk about Roan, how nice the clothing is. My husband wears a lot of it, Nate, full disclosure. I've been a bit jealous because you haven't had women's apparel, at least yet. I know you have plans to launch it later this year. What does that look like, and how are you approaching the market for women? So, you know, the, the move to do women's has been a long time coming. It's something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about it. It was never just this idea of, okay, there's a lot more female customers. We should just um, start developing a program there. We wanted to really complement her lifestyle. I find it um, a little bit insulting when I see some of the videos and advertising for uh, Women's Active, which just shows kind of endless yoga loops, you know, seemingly endless amounts of time, two hours in the studio. We make real products for real women who lead real lives, and and you know they're the perfect complement to uh, our our male product that we've been investing in. The absolute best fabrics, top tier manufacturing, and we've done a lot, a lot of wear testing on it. And so we're really excited to bring it to the market. We think our uh, female customer who's already shopping for the men in her life will really love it. So hopefully uh, we can get you in some soon. <laughs> Nate, we were just looking on the screen and our viewers saw some of the sports that you're expanding into. Golf was one of those as well, where there was a big push we know. Last year, of course, the sports seen a lot of growth post-pandemic as people were just looking to get outside. But we also got some unintended news earlier this week with Tiger leaving Nike, at least, you know, severing the ties for now. Is, is there a Roan bid at works here to get uh, the GOAT? You know, the amount of people that sent me that article... <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
um, you know, we're, we're, we're scrapping together a few five, you know, 500 million so we can uh, have some conversations with Tiger. Um, but in all seriousness, there's a lot of really um, great opportunities in the golf space. You know, one of the exciting things also with women's is the amount of female participation in golf is significantly up over the last five years. The LPGA has become really exciting to watch. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities in golf right now, and we're going to continue to invest in it as a, as a space and as a sport for us. We're really excited about it. What does that expense management look like for you to, to really invest in that next leg of growth as you're thinking about potential sponsorships, getting into the right sport, and the right partner within the, the athletic landscape? Well, we're fortunate because a lot of brands in our space um, have kind of continued to lose money as they've grown. We've really been able to build a, a profitable business, and that has helped us as we kind of sustain our, our growth. And so we're continuing to kind of use those proceeds and um, the strong investor base that we have to invest in uh, growth. But we're also not trying to hit any artificial numbers. One of the great things about our company is we really control our own destiny, so we can make decisions about how we want to spend that capital and where we choose to spend it on from a growth perspective. Look, already profitable. That's more than some private companies can say right now that are hoping to make their way into the public markets or already have done so. Is that on the docket for you and the team? You know, never say never. Um, I What we have used as a rallying cry is we want to we want to build a public ready business. And um, and that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we think about what our future opportunities are. And also because public companies hold themselves to a very high standard. So that's what we say internally, and we believe it's the right uh, message for us for at this moment. Nate Chekets, congratulations on all your success so far. Uh, best of luck with the expansion plans going forward. Roan Apparel founder and CEO. Thanks so much, Nate. Thanks, guys. Great to see you. Good to see you. Well, we have had a very busy week here at Yahoo Finance, bringing you all the stories that are moving and shaking the markets. We're going to bring you some of those top moments, also other stories to keep in mind as we get you set for the rest of the trading day. We'll be right back. This is the future of the toilet. The black, hone black version will run a retail around 10,500. Yahoo Finance is on the ground here in Las Vegas at CS 2024, where we've been walking around trying to find sort of new and unique products. I think we found a good one here. Smart toilets from Kohler. Let's see, and there it goes, opened up. To walk us through all this, we've got Andrew Van Gordon. He is the product manager right. for Smart Toilet Correct. Tech Polar. Yes, welcome. What do we have here? This is the future of the toilet, right? So this is our new Me 2.0 Smart Toilet. As you saw, it automatically opens as you walk up to it. Completely touchless experience as you walk away. It's going to close and flush behind it. What's great about you know the new Me is the sensor here on the side. Why don't you go ahead and put your foot right okay, next to that sensor. This Here is the, the age-old debate, by the way, exactly. whether you have the seat up, up or, or seat down. Up or down, right? Okay, all right? So let's see. Put my foot up here. That's right. A little there sensor to automatically open the seat ring as well. So and how do I close it? Try it again. That same sensor, blue light, there you go. We'll also close it and flush behind it as well. So all of our smart toilets are built in with that automation, touchless control. Be able to control a couple key things, the lighting that you see wrapped around the side. So right now you've got blue lighting. Can we change that? You can. We'll go ahead and change it again to a yellow sunrise type of theme. Heated seats. Heated seats, warm air dryer. And the bidet. Built-in bidet with customized spray temperature, spray position. How much is this going to cost us? The black, home black version will run a retail around 10500 Let's see what else we have here. So over here we have our new Pure Wash E930 bidet seat. What's great is it's really slim profile. One of our thinnest designs on the market so far, but also introduces some automatic open and close technology as well. A first for our bidet seat lineup. Easy to install, maybe a little bit lower in price point compared to the new me we talked about earlier. All right, let's go to your concept toilet. Awesome, yeah, let's take a look. <laughs> 
So here we have our Numi 2.0. A bit more visual. With a little bit more visual, a concept that we're introducing called e-ink technology. You might have seen it in other industries, but we're applying it to the glass on top here to really give it a design increase over what we saw earlier. So here we have it demonstrating a different design pattern, changing constantly in a routine or a pattern. The thought process here is to allow consumers and designers an extra edge over other designs to customize and really personalize their space. So this is just concept, but somebody's yeah. got to spend a lot of time in the bathroom, right? Yeah. To really yeah. appreciate yeah. these yeah. toilets. This is the center stone of your bathroom. This is the showpiece. Something tells me this is going to be more than 10000 it might be. We're still evaluating pricing. Are you finding that people, more and more people, are, are, are splurging in this space? A little bit, yeah. The I mean, this feels like ultimate luxury. Exactly. A lot of people over the last few years have realized that incorporating bidets into their lifestyle is a meaningful change for them. A lot cleaner, a lot more comfortable, a lot more convenience built into the bathroom. So great space to invest and get that longevity out of a piece of artwork, furniture, but it's a toilet. It is a toilet. Andrew, can we call you the toilet guy? You can call me the Thank toilet guy. Thank you for taking us on the toilet today. Thank you very much for stopping by. First day of earnings season, big banks kicking off the results that we're getting. Let's start with some of the results that we got this morning. Our three themes or three takeaways from these earnings reports from JP Morgan, Bank of America, City, and Wells Fargo. Brad, 
Three things that I'm focused on. First, the comments that we heard from JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, a bit tepid in terms of his outlook here for 2024. He went on to say that he does expect pos the possibility of inflation to be stickier and rates to be higher than what the markets expect. I bring this up because that's obviously could potentially put pressure on companies outside of banks, a number of sectors, consumer staples, consumer discretionary. You talked about airlines a little bit today with Delta. That could have the impact or potential here to really pressure some of the results that we're getting not only this quarter, but also looking out to 2024. Cost discipline, something that we've been talking about now for quite some time. City cutting another 20,000 jobs. This is all part of the bank's transformation or turnaround plan that's underway from CEO Jane Frazier. And then also deal activity. Yeah. There's been lots of anticipation of a rebound here in deal activity. At least the numbers that we're getting from these banks doesn't exactly match up with the optimistic outlooks that we've heard from another of the, a number of bankers and a number of analysts here over the last couple of weeks. I'm just sitting here grinning. Get pumped, everybody. It's earnings <laughs> season once again. I mean, this fresh business news is going to be coming at you like water out of a firing hose. So at the end of the day here, one of the things that I am watching very closely, as we were mentioning at the top of the show, and some of the pull through perhaps that we can expect this earnings season is really what we heard about the consumer from Delta CEO Ed Bastian. And I always love to get some of his economic read and how he's really seeing the consumer environment. And one of the things that he mentioned during my call with him was where he says that, you know, depending upon where you're looking at within this environment, the consumer generally is in a good spot. Now, remember, they're catering to a very premium customer here, and he acknowledges that some might have a different perspective depending upon where you're sitting in the economy. And we're going to hear a range of that over the course of this earnings season. And one area that we can continue to track, especially for some of the business to consumer companies, is the prices that consumers are willing to pay. Now, it's also the cycles that many of these businesses are moving through. And for Delta, that was one that's present. We saw the ascension uh, and the return of post-pandemic travel. 2023 was the first year where we finally re, re or eclipsed a pre-pandemic level. And so now, what does cruising altitude look like and does leveling off of some of that margin growth, does that hit some of the investor sentiment? That's going to be some of the larger business story narratives that we hear about on the cyclical levels here as we move on throughout. And we're just getting season. started. Let's go. Lots yes. to look forward to next week. Come on now. <laughs> All right, let's give you guys one more check of the markets here before we let you go. As investors digest the first round of earnings reports, you're looking at pressure almost across the board with the Dow off 225 points. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Tuesday. I did the best I could to get markets pumped. <laughs>
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akufo. Here's what we're watching at this hour. Earnings kicking off with a bang this morning from big banks. J.P. Morgan leading the charge with record annual profit. We're going to break down what these results signal about the state of the consumer. Indeed, and also crude awakening. Oil prices climbing higher following a U.S.-led airstrike on Yemen's Houthis. We'll discuss the moves in price this hour. Plus, making a trip down the aisle this year? We're going to speak to the CEO of David's Bridal later on in the show. That's right. But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring this morning. Looking at some selling off action continuing here, the Dow currently off about 218 points. We're seeing United Health weighing on the Dow. The S&P 500, they're also down, but to a much lesser degree, just down about six points there. Energy, though, at least at the forefront there. Looking at the tech-heavy Nasdaq, also down about 17 points. We saw that PPI coming in a little softer than expected, down for three months versus what we saw with CPI ticking up for December. Markets, though, still not convinced. Let's see what that means for the Treasury market as well as we track those moves for you here. Looking at the shortest term yield, that's down about 1.5% on the day. Looking at the 10-year, currently under, under 4 at the moment, sitting at 3.95. 30-year, flat at 4.18. Well, happy earnings season to all who celebrate. The big banks kicked off the fourth fiscal quarter before the bell with a pretty mixed picture. You can see JP Morgan and Citigroup were in the green, as you can see now, just JP Morgan at the moment in the green, while Bank of America and Wells Fargo falling about 90 minutes into the trading day. Now, the big theme that we're honing in on today is what these results say about the consumer. In that vein, let's get into some of our key takeaways here. So as we look at what we saw, we've got the four biggest banks here. We're looking at credit loss provisions and net interest income. Um, so when we think about the state of the consumer, of course, we're thinking about interest rates. And so we saw Jamie Dimon was saying, look, the economy continues to be resilient. Consumers still spending, expecting a soft landing. But when you look at net interest income or NII, that's your revenue from loans, things like mortgages and autos, minus um, what you pay out um, in expenses for deposits and funds. They had a bumper year here. But there was a word of caution, though, as we expect those interest rates at some point to start declining and that start to take a bite in here, Akiko. Yeah, you know, Rochelle, when you look at the major banks here, uh, talking about the broader headline, it feels like we're seeing a bit of a divergence, right? I mean, you noted at J.P. Morgan, um, record profit here, record annual profit, I should say. At the same time, we're hearing from Citigroup about the cut to 10 percent of its workforce, something that was expected. But as it relates to the com consumer, some interesting comments coming through, uh, specifically on credit loss provisions. Wells Fargo certainly seeing higher provisions or higher, uh, uh, higher provisions there, uh, $1.28 billion compared with the nine, $957 million in the same period last year. In many ways, as you pointed out, Rochelle, we're hearing about the resilient consumer, but potential word of caution on the horizon as we look ahead. CEO Charlie Scharf saying that as we look forward, our business performance remains sensitive to interest rates and the health of the U.S. economy. Also, some interesting comments coming through from Jeremy Barnum over at C uh, over at uh, J.P. Morgan. He's a CFO there, talking about that soft landing you mentioned. You know, he's saying, look, the consensus is for a soft landing. He's looking at the consumer resilience. He says all of the relevant metrics are normalized. Cash buffers are more normal, but that also means consumers are spending more than they're, they're taking in. So he noted on the conference call, it's a bit of a wait and see here in terms of what we're going to see from the consumer. They've spent all that money during the holidays. How do things look come January, February, moving forward? That's a big question mark, at least as it relates to the consumer. It's true. I mean, and even going into this earnings season, Jamie Dimon was saying, look, this is going to be the year where people finally ran out of those pandemic savings. Although I think for most people, they feel like they've run out of those savings a long time ago. But it does speak, speak to that tipping point and a lot of the risks that they think that the markets are underplaying here. And when you think of a bank like B of A, which is even more exposed to interest rate changes because of its broader retail market there, we are expecting to see that weakness continue. So We'll continue to see that show up probably in earnings reports. And of course, the bank's kicking off this earnings season. So something of a bellwether. So I'm sure investors watching this and, and keeping a close eye on what this means for the rest of earnings season. 
Yeah, it's going to be a busy few weeks ahead here, and it certainly is not just about those results, but also the forecast and how things look moving forward. Uh, let's do a quick check of the major indices again, about 90 minutes into the trading day. Uh, taking a look at uh, all three majors, down, uh, Dow down 194 points, the S&P 500 down four, and the Nasdaq down eight. Investors digesting a slew of results that hit before the bell. As we mentioned, those big banks results. Delta Airlines and United Health were also seeing producer inflation data weighing on the Dow. This was our first week of big data and company news. But as the year goes on, what can we expect to move stocks? More the Fed or earnings? We have Dana Dioria, Investment Investnet PMC co-chief investment officer. Dana, it's good to talk to you today. Let me just get your read, first of all, what we got from the major banks, what you think this says about where we're headed in the weeks ahead from some of the results getting from the major companies. Well, I think, um, you know, there, there's definitely, obviously, interest rates are the big driver here. So I think so far, so good from, from that perspective um, with banks. But, you know, there's a long way to go in this earnings season. I think what's interesting about the earnings season is just, you know, considerably high expectations uh, for EPS that that persist and, um, you know, an expectation, even if you look out like uh, all of 2024, um, you know, what the expectation is both uh, from an earnings growth perspective, as well as, um, you know, market. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is going to depend on ability to keep having productivity gains, it, it keep being able to stay in a place where, um, you know, we can keep margins under control. So, uh, you know, I I think there's a lot of positivity uh, very much worked into the market. I, I'm sure that's not a view that you're, you know, anything revelatory there. Um, but so far, so good with the start, right? Indeed. So as we're just at the beginning here, what are some of the earnings bellwethers that you're going to be looking for and what you'll be sort of passing through as you look at the forecasts? Yeah, I think um, certainly uh, financials, but I, I think, you know, there it, it's hard not to say all eyes on on big tech and communication and um, you know those magnificent seven stocks because let's let's face it at this point you know thirty percent of the index where goes those stocks goes goes the goes the uh, index and and the economy at large right so um, I think those are going to be uh, places that we're going to look heavily I think there's going to be a lot of interest around you know are these defensive positions the way we've been treating them in the last couple of years now. Um, where you know it's the place to go if we end up in a risk-off type of situation, which we are, of course, not right now. And, and that's why you're seeing them behave the way they are. Um, but earnings is where you kind of start to suss out you know, how cyclical are some of the revenues that those companies depend on, ad revenue, for example, where if we do uh, kind of trend into you know, a light recession even, uh, which, some of, which you're getting some forecasts for now, right? Um, I, think there's, I, think, I think there's kind of a, you know, hey, we're going to stick the landing or maybe, you know, a, a, a light recession. I think that's where you're going to get some insight from the from those companies. Uh, Dana, or in the first few weeks of this year, so certainly investors kind of still looking at their portfolio to see what the outlook's like in 2024. Um, you've talked about the, the amount of cash that's sitting on the sideline, $6 trillion. How do they put that to work? Yeah, um, well, I think, you know, as a starter, um, it's an interesting thing to look back on this year. And, you know, you had a lot of I, where I am, we're looking at the financial advisor space and you have a lot of advisors who oversee the managed accounts of their clients. And a lot of clients kind of taking money and sitting on the sidelines, locking in or taking advantage of the, the high cash rates. Um, you know, and so we see money markets at six trillion dollars. Um, you know, double what it was not that long ago, right? So, um, what, 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 where did we go with that cash? Well, yes, you you locked in and you got higher rates for for the cash, uh, but at the same time, if you did that, you missed an absolutely phenomenal year in the equity market. You no, know, S and P five hundred up twenty six percent, but even even um, small caps, even international stocks, uh, double digit returns here. Um, so, if you're in the in the market, typically. And you were pulling money out of the market, kind of waiting for this downturn, waiting for this recession and saying, well, I'm just going to go on the risk free because it, because I'm finally getting you know paid there. You, you missed out on a phenomenal year, you know, standard 60, 40. There was a lot of consternation this year about the 60, 40. Right. Because for five minutes there, equities and bonds were, were showing some losses at the same time. And every geez, you know, maybe I should just go to cash. 
I think 2023 is going to stand as, you know, one of these cautionary examples and tales for financial advisors to talk to clients about that you really can't market time. You really have to kind of stay in the market and, and wait out the, the bad with the good in order to get the return. Because as we know, it's not 10% year after year. It's years like we just had, 26%. And then, uh, you know, maybe some negative years and you put them all together and you hopefully get around 10 to 12%. <laughs> And you raise a good point because a lot of people are still trying to buy the dip at this point, trying to time the market, which, as you mentioned, never a good idea. But as you look at the most beaten up sectors over the past year, utilities and energy, how much upside do you expect heading into 2024? Yeah, I think, well, that's the name of the game right now, right? So if you look at valuations, of course, we know, I mean, starting with the Magnificent Seven, very, very priced uh, to perfection, um, but large caps in general, just sitting at, obviously, we, we come into the air at 19 times on, you know, your standard um, S&P 500 index um, and, you know, looking at price to earnings and, and you're saying, okay, uh, what, where where should I position? I think there's there's two ways to look at it. One, you can look at some of these sectors that you're mentioning, um, some of these areas of the market, like small caps, for example, even international. International developed is running at about average uh, valuations. Inter uh, emerging stocks are below average valuations. But you know those sec sectors that have been beaten down, um, small caps international, they're all valued more attractively than your standard large cap index, right? And so if you're thinking in terms of a long-term play, we know that buying at a lower price tends to pay off over time. If you're thinking in terms of short run and what do I expect to happen, um, we know obviously that we end December was a phenomenal month. In fact, if you look at the earnings of small caps last year, the vast majority of the earnings of the entire year happened at the very end of the year. So we're clearly on a run with these beaten down areas of the market. And to a certain extent, there's there's probably some momentum behind that. We're still getting some good numbers coming in that sort of uh, feed the fuel or fuel the fire, excuse me, for you know kind of that risk on view. Um, the one caution, and you have to be willing to sit through this, is yeah. So, you know, small caps were beaten down, for example, and probably in large part because they're interest rate sensitive. And so if the market's pricing in six rate cuts mm -hmm. this year and we don't get all six there, you know, there, there, there are reasons to think there could be cracks. We've got an election year ahead. You know, we could have volatility in the market that kind of affects these areas. Um, but if you can kind of sit through yeah. it, valuation yeah. suggests you, you have a good play for the medium to long term. Yeah, a lot of potential risks to navigate there for investors. Dana Dioria, InvestNet PMC co-CIO. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Well, coming up, the roadmap for investing. City's global head of macro and emerging market strategy, Dirk Willer, is going to break down his top trading ideas for 2024. That's next. Stay with us. From iPhones and iPads to Macs, Apple Watches, and AirPods, Apple's products are a daily necessity for millions, and the numbers prove it. The company generated more than $394 billion in revenue in 2022 alone. But how were they able to achieve such staggering success? Beyond the ticker charts its path to becoming a tech giant. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple in Los Altos, California in 1976. That same year, Wozniak built the company's first product, the Apple One. Apple debuted the Macintosh with its now iconic 1984 commercial during Super Bowl 18. The Macintosh stood out because it was the first mass market personal computer to feature a graphical user interface and mouse. Jobs left Apple after his famous falling out with CEO John Scully in 1985 and subsequently founded the next computer company. In 1991, Apple introduced the PowerBook line, which set the standard for most modern laptops. In 1996, after a run of CEOs, Jobs returned to Apple. The company purchased Next to use its operating system and named Jobs interim CEO in 1997. Apple introduced the iMac in 98, and the line would go on to sell millions of units. Three years later, Apple debuted its first iPod, which could store roughly a thousand songs. And that same year, the company opened its first Apple stores. But it was in 2007 that Apple unveiled its most important product of all, the iPhone. A revolutionary device, the iPhone helped create an entire business model around apps and the App Store. Jobs suffered from pancreatic cancer towards the end of his second term as CEO. He resigned from the company just before his death, and Tim Cook took over as CEO in 2011. In 2015, Apple took the wraps off of its first new device since Cook took over as head of Apple, the Apple Watch. 
Just seven years later, Apple became the world's first publicly traded company to reach a market cap of $3 trillion. And in June 2023, the company unveiled its most ambitious product yet, the Vision Pro. A mixed reality headset, the Vision Pro is scheduled to launch in early 2024. Major banks are in focus today as they kick off the start of earnings season. Now, those results, one of many factors weighing on investors as they look to position their portfolio for 2024. Now, our next guest has put out the roadmap, highlighting the top 10 themes likely to affect your investment, including central bank policy and political elections. Let's bring in Dirk Willer, City Global Head of Macro and Emerging Market Strategy, to discuss more. Thank you for joining us this morning. And so, I want to start, first of all, of course, we had that, that PPI data. So I want to talk about, I guess they go hand in hand, inflation and delayed easing cycles as they sort of navigate these month by month data that's really throwing some people off. Talk about why that made the cut for your must-see report this year. Yeah, no, thanks very much for having me on your show. Um, it, it's a very good question. In the end, that's what we are, the, the single biggest uh, factor will be whether inflation indeed comes off as quickly as the market is expecting, right? Because that will, in the end, allow the Fed to ease, and that will generate the soft landing that the market is, is gunning for. And, um, and uh, we are a bit skeptical just how quickly uh, inflation comes off. Um, and we do think, therefore, that um, the easing cycle will be slightly more delayed than the markets are currently pricing. Um, and we also think that actually the, the, the break-even, seeing the, the implied inflation is, is a touch too low. And um, we think those are actually really, you can structure quite attractive trades around that theme. Um, in particular for, for the March Fed meeting, the market is pricing by a uh, high chance of, of the start of the easing cycle in March. And um, you can actually come up with a structure where the only way you lose is if they go with 50 uh, basis points cuts, which I think is quite unlikely because these aggressive easing cycles really only happen when uh, when there is a hard landing the Fed is worried about. In a soft landing scenario, you don't tend to go with these very aggressive easing cycles. So City believes we start cutting in July, not in March, and, um, and therefore their attractive trades positioning for a delayed uh, cycle, both in the US actually, but also in the UK. 
Yeah, Dirk, uh, you know, as you said, inflation has really been the single biggest focus for major central banks. But it sounds like you might start to see a bit of a divergence. Last year was about the central banks really trying to tame inflation by keeping rates high, Bank of Japan put aside. What are we likely to see this year and how much more of that divergence are we going to see? Yeah, and Chair Powell clearly wants to generate a soft landing. Right. And therefore, he wants to be proactive and start easing, uh, even with the economic outlook still being relatively strong. And he, he will be able to do that if inflation really comes off relatively fast. And, uh, and we do see inflation coming off, of course, at City as well, uh, just maybe not as fast as is priced into the break-even market. So that um, that is happening. I think the inflation cycle is also a uh, global cycle, so there won't be that much divergence between the various inflation uh, measures you get across the globe. Again, as you point out, Japan is a little bit different. Um, but uh, but we, we do think inflation will be benign enough that the easing cycle will start. We're just quibbling a little bit with the fact that, uh, you know, how early and how aggressive can the central bank be, given that inflation um, will maybe come off slightly uh, more slowly than what is priced. And so that's why both the delayed easing cycle made it into our top themes, but also the uh, the long break, even inflation made it as a, uh, into the top themes. And I think it's also attractive from a portfolio hedging perspective, because, you know, the, 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 the market fully bought into the soft landing. Um, and indeed, right now, a lot of indications point to a soft landing. But um, if there's a if, if that were not to pan out, then the main reason would be that inflation, especially ex goods and ex housing, is slightly stickier. So that would protect your portfolio as well. And as and as you know, market not really managing its inflation expectations here, as we saw from that J.P. Morgan report, ex still expecting six rate cuts uh, to come this year. Um, so then, as you look, as we're in the thick of earnings season, broader broadening EPS was also on that list. There, what is the play here, strategy wise, then? Yeah, for us, it means a broadening out from this heavy reliance on the large cap growth sector in the U.S. And uh, it, it, we expect it to branch out actually in two dimensions. One is that uh, cyclicals will do well um, in the U.S. And, um, you know, cyclicals will meaningfully outperform defensives. And it's not a negative call on the, on the um, large cap tech names. It's just to get to our 5,100 target for the S&P, you cannot only rely on the large caps. You do need, um, you do need basically the cyclicals to, uh, to punch uh, as well. And that's what we're expecting for this year. So it's the industrials that will do well and so forth. Uh, but the, the broadening out theme should also happen uh, in a geographic context. Right? So again, the fact that the US uh, was uh, so strong driven by this large cap uh, tech names um, means that this year we can also see Europe doing really quite well, which also has a strong cyclical band. And we like mm. to pair that against the UK. So our trades are cyclicals against defensives in the US, and we would pair long Europe against the UK um, more globally. Uh, Dirk, one of the other investment themes you highlight is uh, Chinese stimulus. It was just a year ago we were talking about a potential big bounce back coming from a very uh, zero or zero COVID policy that hasn't necessarily materialized. Are you talking about monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus, and more importantly, how big of a bounce back is that likely to lead to? Yeah. Yeah, for us, the trade in China is more fixed income trade than an equity trade. So we, we do expect uh, more stimulus, and we think it shifts from the fiscal that has been announced earlier to the monetary. So we do expect interest rate cuts. We do expect uh, triple R cuts. Uh, we've seen already big liquidity injections. And um, and that, will, that means to us that uh, Chinese bonds are, are going to do well. And we actually uh, positioned at the front end of the Chinese curve, um, and, and that is maybe our our biggest uh, China position, if you like. On the equity market, um, it's noteworthy how poorly it traded, even in the light of the additional stimulus. So basically, the the private sector is finding it very hard to get its mojo back, and that is not too surprising, of course, given the extent of the real estate bust uh, that we have witnessed in China. So at this stage, um, we are more confident that there will be more stimulus on the monetary side, which you could benefit from in the Chinese fixed income market, rather than necessarily positioning for the stimulus being sufficient 
to uh, get Chinese equities to move again. Because um, even in the US, I think we learned how long it can take and how hard it is to uh, to get uh, the consumer and maybe the corporates out of their funk after big housing busts. And in China, it's not different, maybe even worse, because the policymakers are less aggressive than they were in the US. And um, so, you know, we position for more stimulus, um, but we don't position necessarily for more stimulus driving the equities higher, at least not yet. Dirk Willer, City Global Head of Macro and Emerging Market Strategy. Uh, appreciate some of those takeaways. Certainly interesting report there. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, coming up, oil prices surge as tensions heat up in the Red Sea. We're going to dive more into the fallout from the geopolitical unrest on the other side. We'll be right back. It's January and it's cold in New York City. So the Yahoo Finance team is packing up its skis and investing knowledge and heading to the Swiss slopes for the World Economic Forum in Davos. I know what you're thinking, folks. It's colder there in Switzerland, but myself, Julie Hyman, and the Yahoo Finance Live team plan to heat things up with some big time interviews with the who's who of global business. The so-called masters of the universe will convene around the theme of rebuilding trust. There's no trust issues here, you can rely on us to ask the most important questions to the world's most high-profile leaders. Is the world more divided than it has ever been before? Is AI really bigger than the internet? Is this year's huge election cycle the risk we've all been missing? Will the bull market in stocks end really badly? You won't miss anything with our wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Yahoo Finance Live and the Yahoo Finance platform, from top leaders in the banking, pharma, and crypto sectors to access the world's foremost academics and some policymakers for good measure. We've got you covered. Yahoo Finance's coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos starts on Tuesday, January 16th. You don't want to miss it. Oil prices are higher today, up roughly one and a half percent as the U.S. and the U.K. strike Houthi targets in Yemen. That's raising concerns about a disruption in oil supply. Let's bring in Dan Dicker, founder of The Energy Word. Um, Dan, just kind of break this down for me here. What kind of disruption are we talking about and what does that ultimately mean in the context of global energy supply? Good morning, Akiko. I, I you know, in, on balance, I don't find this to be a tremendous threat on global energy supply. What it is is a, of a, a long string 
of Iranian financed actors who have been uh, engaging against uh, Western oil um, supply chain issues for decades, uh, this time, you know, ginned up by the Israeli uh, movements in Gaza. And uh, while, you know, this is sort of a give and take in terms of the military action here, in terms of the actual ability for Houthi rebels to actually close down the Red Sea and, and kind of deny shipping lanes to the UK and the US and others, uh, you know, I, on balance, I don't find that to be a tremendous threat. Why oil is up today is more about the nervousness of traders who have been increasingly unenthusiastic about oil and have been as short as they've ever been since well before the pandemic. Now, to me as a trader, that is really the big deal that's going on in this marketplace. We have a lot of speculative players inside the uh, the fossil fuel markets who are short, or and, and the ones who are normally long have been reticent to buy oil, even down here in the low 70s. And so anytime there is any kind of geopolitical risk that's kind of drummed up, uh, you get some weak shorts who tend to, you know, run for the uh, the exits, and that's why you see the uh, the rally today, which you know, quite frankly, isn't very impressive at a buck and a half. I mean, and Dan, considering that at one point last year we were looking at potential um, projections of a hundred dollars a barrel for oil here, talk about the supply side here. Some of the issues that you're watching, especially when you think about Iran and Saudi Arabia as well. What do you think are going to be the catalyst to watch this year? Yeah, Rochelle, this has been very interesting because while there has been some, you know, issues on supply, what hasn't uh, kind of uh, come across in 2023 and all of 2023 is the demand increase that we all expected post-pandemic, particularly from China. Also here in the United States, um, demand is down uh, as low as it's been pre-pandemic. Uh, and uh, that has uh, gone against what has been the most oil produced by U.S. oil producers since before the pandemic. We're at a record of 13.2 million barrels a day. So what didn't kind of uh, materialize over 2023 and into 2024 was the demand to go with what this, you know, the supply shortage that the, the OPEC and others have been bringing to the marketplace. They have been bringing to the marketplace. So on balance, what you've seen is both the Saudis the Iranians and the Russians have been working really hard to try and find new markets for oil, even at these lower prices. The Saudis, for example, last week cut oil prices going to the east by two dollars a barrel, which is, you know, a pretty desperate measure when you think about it with oil already down in the 70s. The Iranians have demanded more money from the Chinese for their oil supplies because the Chinese have also taken advantage of what is a very, very, very uh, weak supply market to make very, very um, opportunistic deals with the Iranians and the Russians and others. So in all ways, while the traders are incredibly short, I sit here and kind of feel like they're kind of right. And uh, at least for the time yeah. being, I do not see oil getting constructive uh, despite this kind of short covering rally for uh, at least the, you know, the first quarter of 2024. Uh, Dan, you're saying they're kind of right, as in the speculative traders, based on the supply you're seeing or, or the demand? Because there's been concern about that pulling back significantly. Both, both. The supply has come up quite significantly, despite the cutbacks from the, uh, the Saudis and the rest of OPEC, particularly here in the United States. And demand has been, quite frankly, pretty pathetic. Um, particularly from China, which has been really the driving force of demand in the oil market for the past three or four years. And it's not much better here in the United States. There's been, despite uh, quite a, a robust economy here in the United States and, and decent spending numbers and jobs and so forth, has not been the kind of concurrent uh, demand increase inside of um, um, refined products that many of us expected to see. We just haven't seen it. We don't expect to see it. With that said, Dan, what kind of levels are we talking about in terms of uh, prices here? Low 70s? Uh, well, is that kind of where you, you know, where you that's always the, the, the million-dollar question. I, I, I hesitate to give um, to give targets. I would say that uh, for now, it's the, the range is bounded by, you know, the high 70s. And on the downside, I would not hesitate at all to start wading into oil stocks, which are already pretty cheap 
if we did get some prices significantly below $70 a barrel. But in terms of targets on the downside of their upside right now, I'd say we're range bound. Um, but I am more apt at this point to kind of uh, wait out this kind of demand supply um, problem with uh, cheap oil stocks if they get quite a bit cheaper. They're already, for example, Exxon's already under $100 a barrel. If it got closer to 90, it would not be something that I wouldn't readily recommend to my subscribers around that level. So you have a sort of an idea of, right. of where value starts to uh, make itself felt inside the oil market. Uh, once oil gets below $70, there's, it's, there starts to be some serious value inside the oil space. And Dan, just very quickly, because you mentioned the, the China turnaround story that hasn't materialized yet. Are you predicting that will perhaps pick up this year or is that still not on the radar? Very interesting. You know, I'm not the economist. I'm sort of an oil guy. And, and we've seen stimulus come out of China. We've seen all sorts of activity from the Chinese government try and stimulate, um, you know, a post-pandemic uh, uh, growth spurt from China. And so far, it's it hasn't materialized. So, you know, like a lot of traders, I'm waiting for a sign. And, uh, you know, whether that will materialize based on what the Chinese do or, or don't do, uh, again, uh, the, the, the guy from City who was on before he was best able to answer that as opposed to me. I appreciate that. We'll see if that, that Chinese demand for oil does end up picking up at some point. Dan Dicker, the Energy Word founder, thank you for your time this morning. Well, Tesla is the latest company impacted by ongoing turmoil in the Red Sea. The car maker is halting most operations in its plant in Germany for two weeks. That's according to a report by Reuters. It's saying the maritime attacks are impacting its ability to produce cars. For more on this, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Pras Subramanian to break this down for us. Hey, Pras. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah, so just kind of like what you said right there, these, these uh, Red Sea sort of impact here on Tesla's Giga Berlin operations. The company's telling Reuters that they're uh, basically delaying production or halting production for the Model Y. That, that's the car they build there for about uh, a little less than two weeks or so. Uh, and because this is the fact that they cannot get components from Asia uh, that come through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, they have to go around the Cape of Good uh, Hope, I believe, on, in South Africa. And that's going to be a much longer journey. It's going to cost more. So they got to wait to get these parts. And that's a, that's a problem for them. We also just heard just today that Volvo also pausing production for a few days at a plant in Belgium, in Belgium because they can't get uh, gearbox parts from Asia as well. Hmm, that just points to just the global footprint so many of these car makers have. Pros. We're also seeing reports of Tesla boosting pay for U.S. factory workers. What does that ultimately mean for the company? Big win for UAW, right? Yeah, I'm surprised we haven't heard from Sean Fain yet uh, kind of saying thank me for, for what we've done with the UAW, increasing pay for, with the big three now, we're seeing that spillover effect. Uh, we saw that most recently at Nissan, Toyota, and other non, uh, non-union non shops in the U.S. having to raise pay because in response to workers seeing what the UAW got, uh, got for the for the big three. And here we have a report from Bloomberg News. They saw a flyer or, or, or were able to see a flyer that was handed out at the factory for all production workers at, at Tesla. They're going to raise pay. For, I believe they're calling it a market adjustment pay increase. We don't know what exactly the the pay increase is, but if it's similar to what we saw at places at Toyota and Nissan, it could be from 10 to 20 percent increase pay, which is it's significant, but also comes right after that big UAW contract. Uh, not surprisingly here because of the fact that these are the pressures that are facing, you know, workers or I'm sorry, the companies uh, that are facing uh, pressure from workers who are demanding higher pay because they're seeing what's happening with the unions. Exactly. When you're, especially when you pair that with the cost of living and you see your you know, fellow colleagues making more money, definitely more impetus there. I don't know. The, Tesla really didn't seem that open to, to the unionizing idea. So at least this is one way to perhaps hedge their bets there. Joining us, thank you so much, our very own Pras Romanian. All right, coming up, here comes the brides. Industry experts say 2024 is shaping up to be a big year for the wedding industry. We're talking with the CEO of dress retailer David's Bridal about demand they're seeing for the year ahead. That's next.
2024 is shaping up to be a big year for the wedding industry. Signet Jewelers, the largest jewelry company in the U.S., noted it expects significantly more people to pop the question this year in a return to pre-pandemic levels. And more brides means more dresses. Enter David's Bridal. Now, the retail company offers a range of wedding and bridesmaids dresses at its nearly 200 stores. But after filing bankruptcy in 2023, how is the company best positioning itself for the year ahead? With us now is Jim Markham, David Bridal's CEO. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So this is expected to be a bumper year as we look at what happened during the pandemic. Sort of people who met online, you know, we're coming up on that three year, four year period here. How is David's Bridal positioning itself to take advantage of this demand? Well, actually we're, we're encouraging. We're seeing a lot of positive momentum starting to build for the bridal customer. Um, you know, our appointments are lifting in January, coming out of December. And as you mentioned before, one of the, the big bellwether companies in the industry around engagement, Signet Jeweler, is starting to see, you know, a lot of encouraging signs around the dating process, engagements, relationships, search terms, those kind of things, which really set us up, you know, nicely as we look forward into 24 and beyond. Um, you know, our teams are fully engaged in, you know, really in the product development side on some pretty, you know, big changes in product. I shouldn't say big changes, but uh, some unique product offerings of newness that are coming in with new fabrics and those kind of things. So we're, we're excited. Uh, Jim, you know, when you think about the last few years and the spike we saw in weddings, that was about weddings that were put on hold as a result of the pandemic. Um, this is kind of the way of coming out of the pandemic, relationships that started after. Are you finding that the bride's are spending the same amount of money or maybe pulling back a little and becoming cautious? Now, it, it, you know, our research is showing she's, she is very price minded, which what makes David so unique and how we're positioned in the marketplace. I mean, our bridal dresses, you know, we have a, a, a belief that we want to put a bride, every bride in a dress and our price points go from $199 in bridal and $99 in bridesmaids up to $2,500 in bridal. And so we're really there for every, every customer. Um, clearly, the dress remains one of the most important things in her wedding, right? She's very focused on, you know, the style and, and that type of thing of the dress. And, and so she is, um, you know, she engages, she spends a lot of time on inspiration on our websites, and then ultimately we'll book an appointment to come in the stores. So, Jim, as you look at the, the e-commerce versus in-person sales versus also the connections that you're, you're making on TikTok as well, how does that grow in? How does that pull into the growth story and really the turnaround story for David's bridal? Yeah. So if you if you look back at what we've been able to achieve in David's, we've launched a significant loyal or a, a loyalty program that we've had six, significant success with. We today have over 2.5 million members that are brides, um, you know, which is you know, a phenomenal opportunity for us to be able to communicate. Um, what's interesting about the, you know, the David's customer, 85% of all brides, 85 to 90% of all brides and, and actionable brides, I would say, in the country will come into our website at some point. And a lot of that is around inspiration and shopping. We've really expanded our capability there by launching a lot of digital tools, including you know, we, we've launched a marketplace. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but full suites of wedding planning tools and apps and those kind of things. And so what's interesting is when somebody gets engaged, one of the first searches they do is wedding planning tools and wedding planning checklist. And we're there with that with her, you know. So we want to basically work with her all the way through her planning process, bring her in the stores, her dress she likes to come into the store. She likes to try it on. And we have the, you know, the alteration services and everything. But then she builds out her basket. And, and we actually have an assortment for everybody in the wedding party. So we have the bridesmaids. We have the mother of the bride. We have, you know, the guest of the wedding and gifts and accessories and those type of things. So, you know, it, it's a long planning cycle. And she's yeah. engaged all the way through it. Uh, Jim, you just came out of a, a really tough time for the company, um, filing for bankruptcy for the second time. You just mentioned your online presence, these additional tools that you have. 
Is that where the future of David's Bridal is? You closed 100 stores last year. You've still got some that are, you've still got a significant number that are open, but are you increasingly looking to the online presence to, to engineer that turnaround? I think it's a it's a combination of both, right? We're, we think there's an opportunity um, throughout our markets to come up with a way to make sure that we do have a physical presence. And we, we do have a very strong presence, to your point, despite closing 100 stores. Um, but yeah, it's that balance between e-com, inspiration, filling out our basket or accessories or attachments, right? That's going to be important as we move forward. The wedding planning tools, the wedding planning checklist, helping her with finding her florist and all of those kind of things are a big part of, we, th we think it's a big opportunity for David's as we look forward in the future, right? And, you know, what's interesting is we have the broad, you know, we have the vast market share in the country. And I think our price points are right to be able to make sure that we're there for her. And for people who are thinking of David's bridal in, it, in its heyday, perhaps, you know, when it when it first started, compare that with what you have now. You have tuxedos, you're doing for date nights as well. How do you compete, though, with some of these other social social media companies? And of course, you get a lot of cheaper products coming in from China as well. Yeah, we we spend a lot of time marketing, um, monitoring it. And there's no doubt, you know, you've had those online players come in and the competition around that, which is typically around price point and those kind of things. But you know, we believe we've been able to successfully defend our position in that by, as I said, on price point, our bridesmaids dresses start at $99, just like they do. The bridal is very unique. Um, and yes, there are online players and we hear all the stories about how they receive the dress. And then it's on oh, my word, it doesn't fit or it's not what I thought or, or those kind of things. And we actually have had customers walk in our stores with a wedding coming up within two weeks or a week or less. And we've got her in a gown fully altered and, and on, you know, ready to go. So, you know, we are working hard to make sure that we remain relevant in our pricing and the value that we offer. Um, you know, what's unique about David's is we're vertical in our supply chain. So 100% of all those assortments that you see at David's Bridal across all the categories, um, you know, are basically our designs produced by us in our dresses so we can be nimble from a product development point of view. So, you know, I, I think we, you know, we are, we are very focused on main, maintaining that position. Yeah, certainly shaping up to be a busy few months for sure, until you get to the peak of the wedding season. Jim Markham, David's Bridal CEO, good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Well, coming up, I had a big week in Las Vegas at CES. I'm going to give you a roundup of the best things I saw in Vegas. That's coming up on the other side.
Yahoo Finance is on the ground here in Las Vegas at CES 2024. We've had a chance to spend all week walking the floor here to take a look at some of the most entertaining gadgets. Take a look. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you too. Ready? How's my form? Fourth time, here we go. We are in front of the Patch XR booth. <laughs> you see, this guy is inside virtual reality. It allows users to build all the tools to create music in virtual reality. I mean, this guy's got it going. I'm gonna give it a shot. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now we've got multiple layers of beats going. We are at the booth for Barracuda. It's a French health tech company that's developed this mirror. It's an interactive mirror that uses artificial intelligence. How's your day been so far? My day has not been great. Just like a rainy day makes way for sunshine, your mood can improve. I'm at the booth for Doosan Group where this AI robot is about to make me a cocktail. So this is Mix Master Moody, our cocktail bartender. Mix Master Moody. Yeah, it's going to tell you what kind of cocktail you need based upon your mood and facial recognition. I look that way? Yep, you're going to okay. look up there. GPT secret, I'm told. I feel like I'm getting judged on my driving skills. I am. Press green? Yeah. Oh my, oh my god. Oh. <laughs> you horrified, Rich. <laughs> I'm here with Devin Goldberg. He is a staff engineer at Goodyear. He's going to walk me through this simulation. We're going to show you a, a braking distance demo. So we're going to start you off with the ABS tune. Uh, to thinking that it's a new tire, but you actually have a worn tire on the road. All right, and brakes. Oh my God! <laughs> Did I just hit that deer? Well, you might have. <laughs> this is the future of the toilet. As you saw, it automatically opens as you walk up to it. It's going to close and flush behind it. The black, honed black version will run a retail around 10500 so this is just concept, but somebody's yeah. got to spend a lot of time in the bathroom, right? Yeah. To really yeah. appreciate yeah. these yeah. toilets. This is the center stone of your bathroom. This is the showpiece. Oh, wow, look at this. I feel like I'm sitting in first class. This is just what I need right now. Oh, this is <laughs> tickle it. Oh my god, 13 more minutes. 19 minutes left. <laughs> oh my god, this is really intense. There you go, Rochelle. That's what I was doing all week at CES. By the way, I was working. We were reporting on the ground there at CES. But, you know, I do want to just say one thing, because all those fun gadgets get all the attention at the Consumer Electronics Show. But this year, there was a lot of talk about AI on devices, specifically the laptop. That's not a device we consider to be fun, but... So many of these companies really think this is going to be transformational. HP specifically telling me they expect the growth rate for PCs to double in the next three years as a result of generative AI on the actual device. And you raise a good point as to sort of where people are actually going to end up spending their money as consumers buying these things versus the things that get all the headlines. I mean, I was very impressed by Mixed Master Moody. I mean, a chat GPT could have been like a Long Island <laughs> chat GPT. You know what I'm saying? I like the fact that it reads your face to figure that out. <laughs> so I thought that was very yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, where, I, I, where are the use cases, right? I don't know. True. Yeah, it's true. I mean, depending on how much it is. Yeah, that's true. A $10,000 toilet, it's a lot. Yeah, Rochelle, you, you'll have to try it next time. I think you're going to get a happy drink as well. Something tells me AI is going to read you as a very happy person too. But that's <laughs> for maybe the next... CES. Uh, that does it for Rochelle and I in this hour on this Friday. We've got much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.